The Rune Smith Chapter 131 Going to the Bank Roland in his mismatched armor stood there, before him was a smiling Lucille and a somewhat awkward-looking Robert. He was wearing a new knight half-plate armor that must have been a spare. Robert just like Roland had lost his previous armor during the dungeon expedition. Good day Mr. Wayland. Ah, good morning. He was wearing a different suit of armor but the parts covering both his arms were clearly runic in nature. Through this, it was quite easy to tell him apart from regular warriors and knights that did not have enough mana to use gear like this. It's surprising how fate works, I was just looking for Sir. Wayland and he is here. Don't you think, Sir? Robert. Yes, M. Lady. Robert just nodded. Roland expected him to tip a fedora that would fit that reply. He was still acting very gentlemanly when around this young woman. Can I help you with something? Roland was still a bit apprehensive about being around his older brother. It was luck that kept his face hidden away for so long but now he was slowly running out of excuses to wear body covering armor. Yes you can. You didn't think that we would forget about what you did for us down there. That's right. Robert nodded while keeping his arms crossed over and against his wide chest. Today the two were in lighter clothes. Lucille was wearing a full-blown dress that went all the way up to her ankles. She was even holding a parasol over her shoulder to keep the sun rays from hitting her pale face. Robert on the other hand had a blue tunic under that half-plate armor that made him look like some kind of beefy prince. His look was finished off with a long sword strapped to his hip. The two actually looked good together, Robert was quite the handsome man with somewhat different facial features than Roland but some parts were quite similar. It was clear that their father's DNA was running in their veins and if he took off the helmet it would become even more apparent. It's fine, you already thanked me when we were in the dungeon. Roland did remember that he was promised a reward but he didn't care about it that much anymore. The access to that treasure trove was enough for him, he didn't want to be too greedy. His plan was to wait a year or two before going down there to face that boss. Maybe longer depending on how much time he would need to make a golem. That was the thing that he was missing during that fight, something or someone that could tank the hits from that monster. Even at this time, he would probably have enough firepower to pierce that monster's skin. The only problem would be to keep it in place to deliver a critical blow. For that a tough golem made from fire-resistant metal and that could tie down a large creature like that was needed. I must insist, my father always told me to keep my promises. It would be shameful to the Devere name if I didn't. The lady is right, we at the Arden estate have the same rule. Did we have something like that? Roland asked himself as he didn't really recall things like that being mentioned. This could be due to the fact that he was mostly ignored by his father and the other servants. No one really treated him like a proper noble and he himself was not interested in it. He spent most of his days training his basic skills and planning his escape after attending the Young Mage Academy. That of course fell through when he discovered his lack of elemental proficiencies. Even to this day, he did not even have a fraction of a percentage in any of them. It's really fine. The guild gave me a nice bonus for my troubles, and didn't Lady Lucille lose her purse while in the dungeon? Roland was sure that all of the girl's belongings went missing during the dungeon run. Even if she wanted to give him the money she shouldn't be able to. This is unless she asked for some pocket change from one of the other nobles. That is true, but Albrook does have a bank. A bank. Roland thought for a second he recalled hearing something like that being opened a month or two ago. In this kingdom, there was one main bank called the National Bank of Caldries NBC for short. He never really used it as the price of admission was quite steep and also because most of his gold was in circulation. Roland constantly bought new metals and resources. Everything that he earned from selling runic gear was invested into his workshop almost instantly. There was no reason for him to make a bank account. That wasn't the main reason why he never used one, it always came down to his true identity. These banks had costly identification devices, the item that was enough to fool the guild's lower quality analyzing item would not work in the bank. 
while the Adventurers Guild didn't care that much about the true identities and criminal history of their adventurers, the bank did. Roland would need to subject himself to their scanning devices and they would probably see his true name on it. If this information would find its way to his enemies was up to debate. Supposedly the banks were very hush-hush. This didn't mean that his father would not get this information. He was probably safe from the cult with that as they did not know his real name or association with the Arden estate. Yes, luckily I still have my bank card. Lucille proclaimed while holding out a dark-colored card with some strange inscriptions on it. Roland's eyes shone for a fraction of a second as he noticed that there were many tiny runes on it but he also noticed something else that was a first. It's a runic item but I can't debug it. Lucille was presenting the card right in front of his face as she stood there proudly. This allowed him to see everything quite well. Even then, when he strained his senses his debugging skill did not show him the correct paths. It was clear that this was a runic item but the runes were beyond small. If it wasn't for some larger ones sticking out he would have a hard time telling that it was an actual runic item. This could mean two things, either this was not a true runic item and thus his skill didn't work. The other possibility that he was more inclined to believe was that this item was above his skills level. That card, what is it? Ah, this? Did sir? Wayland never see an obsidian bank card. Lucille couldn't tell but Roland was squinting with his eyes while trying to scan this item with his debugging skill. If he focused a lot of mana into his eyes he could see a hazy image of the schematic. It was not complete and faded almost instantly even before he could make out anything insightful. Lady Lucille, that's a bit. Robert turned to the blue-haired girl with an awkward expression. Hey? Oh I didn't mean it like that sir. Wayland. Roland snapped back after burning through 30% of his mana while trying to analyze this black card. From the conversation, it seemed as if Lucille implied that he was not wealthy enough to get one of these cards or even worse to visit a bank. I'm sure the bank would accept sir. Wayland as a client. Besides the strenuous identification requirement, the bank always did a thorough background check. They sometimes even utilized magicians that could see into a person's past to see if they weren't someone in disguise. This of course only left people like nobles and merchants using the banking system. There was a consensus that only after getting a proper bank card could a merchant see themselves as being wealthy. It was far easier to get a card like that if someone was part of a noble household. The background checks were also a lot more lenient. Ah oh no that's fine, I have no use for a card like that. Roland replied while Lucille started flailing her arms around. It seemed that the girl had not yet been pushed through the ringer of the noble life. She seemed overly nice even to someone like him that would be considered a somewhat rare commoner but still only a commoner. What Lady Lucille would like to propose is that you come with us to the bank. To the bank? Ah, yes. I might have lost my purse but I left this card at the mayor's house. Lucille quickly recovered while blushing a bit. It seemed that she did not take all of her possessions down into the dungeon. The card that she was holding would not be useful to anyone besides her as well, so it was even okay to lose it. I will need to buy more materials for this runic forge. Even though Roland did not wish to go with these two, he was in dire need of more funds. Even with the bonus, he received from the guild he still didn't have enough. There were far too many projects that he wanted to sink his time in but not enough gold to go around. Without the reward that he was promised from these two, he would probably need to spend months crafting runic items to sell before being able to invest his time in more important things, like his golem project. Also please take this sir. Wayland. What is this? He asked as Lucille handed him a rolled up scroll. At first, he thought it was some kind of spell scroll but the lady said otherwise. Those are the synchronization coordinates to my own magic crystal, with this we will be able to exchange runic theories even when I leave here. In short, Lucille was giving Roland her phone number. Every mage had their own special crystal ball that they were attuned with. On the scroll, there was an encoded magical number that Roland could use. 
he was a tier 1 mage so he would be able to use any kind of crystal ball meant for communication with ease. Runic theories. Yes, maybe I could even introduce you to the professor. Professor? Wait, you want me to call you when you leave? Um can't I? Lucille pouted slightly after Roland posed the question. Robert raised his brow a little bit as it looked that the runesmith wasn't interested in staying in contact. In reality, this was a very favorable connection that Roland could grow. Most people would fight to have good relations with a promising tier 2 mage. There were various lucrative opportunities waiting for him. He might even be able to get connections to the magic academy that probably had a whole section of runic scriptures. The only problem here was her relations with Robert. Even he could tell that the two had a somewhat deeper bond after venturing into the dungeon. Their future would be a rocky one as Robert did not have the status to go with his noble title. Being only the third son and coming from a commoner merchant side, he didn't have much leverage. The only realistic shot he had was if he gained a lot of military merit as his father before him. Do you have access to more runic knowledge? He asked as it did pique his interest. Even when he stayed in contact with Lucille this didn't mean that Robert would be shadowing her every move. They both went to different academies and also lived in different cities. It wouldn't be strange if the two only had a relationship through letters and magic calls. Yes. We also have a knowledgeable runic mage at our institute, I'm sure the professor will love your take on crafting runes. Apparently, this professor was a runic mage, some proper insight from a mage's perspective to help him with his research could hasten his progress by many years. This didn't seem like such a bad deal, mostly because he didn't have to do anything for it. There were no contracts and dangerous expeditions to the dungeon this time around, it looked to be safe. MMM I'll think about it. Roland nodded while putting the scroll into his spatial bag. This would also be a good moment to get himself a communication crystal. Wonderful. Let us depart to the bank sir. Wayland. After thinking it through there was no real reason for him to refuse more money. He would not be the one using the bank card and they would not be identifying him. This was also a good chance to see how the inside of such a bank looked like. They started walking, Lucille was quite the chatterbox as always while Robert just nodded his head and agreed with whatever she was saying. Surprisingly the theme this time was not runes but remembering the times down in the dungeon. As always, Roland wasn't one to talk. He was more interested in the obsidian bank card that he could not use his debugging skill on. Even against the dark cult, he was able to see the runes in that device that trapped him in an illusion. When thinking back to that time he was inexperienced but now he could somewhat measure its worth. It was an item at the greater grade which would put it along with tier 3 classes. This meant that this card was above it, either an even higher greater item or one at the grand level. From what he knew, these bank cards were given to the nobles with a set sum encoded in them. The person that commissioned this card would deposit a large sum of gold into the bank. The bank would then take a slight cut from it and give the person this card. At other banks, these cards could be read and the client could take out cash. It was quite similar to debit cards from his old world, with the difference that there was no internet to keep track of the exchanges. After a use, the card would have the funds deducted from it at the bank but there was no bank account that others could deposit their money to. It was just a way to safely keep money while traveling. No one could use the cards and a person could always return to the bank that the card was created at. There they could recover their money if something ever happened to their card. This process could take months though, as someone needed to check with all the banks in the kingdom to see if the card was ever used and if the client wasn't a liar. Only after that would a new card be created with a new fee added to it. It was still safer to have it than to walk around with a large purse filled with gold coins. The cards could be hidden away in various ways which also added to the safety. We are here. They stood before a large bank building. This building was pure white and made from sturdy stone. There were columns at the front of the large opening which made this structure somewhat reminiscent of old Greek architecture. It also made it stick out like a sore thumb around the more medieval-looking buildings. In front of it there stood four guards, 
even without identifying them he could tell that they were quite skilled. As the group approached the guards moved to close the path but as the card was shown they moved to the side. Follow me. Lucille was quite cheerful for some reason as they entered. On the inside, he spotted a shiny marble floor. On the sides instead of torches, there were some light crystals that were shining even now. The first thing he noticed were the large columns creating a path forward. Then on the sides, there was something that he was familiar with, iron golems. There were four of them in total and this was probably the main line of defense that this bank was offering. While Lucille and Robert moved forward he slowed down to look at these runic devices. This time around his debugging skill worked just fine and he could see all the external runic traces and large runes. They are similar but of better quality than of the worker golems I've seen before. I welcome you to the official Albrook Bank, I apologize for our lack of staff but we are still in the process of building. They were met with a nicely dressed elven man. He was wearing a dark tailored suit that made him somewhat look like a high class butler. Good day, I would like to withdraw some coin. Lucille bowed politely while Robert nodded at the man as well. It seemed it was time to get his second payday, with so much cash in his possession he could really start expanding his workshop. Chapter 132 Out Shopping Roland glanced at his pouch that contained multiple golden coins. He even started looking over his shoulder, wondering if someone from the Thieves' Guild would mark him after he came out of the bank with both Robert and Lucille. Luckily he did not see any shadowy figures looming in the dark. The guards that were standing around the bank made sure to remove any suspicious elements from the premises. This building was also in the innermost reaches of the city. To get in, a person needed to get past another gate that was surrounded by a large wall. This was recently created and most of the rich merchants lived in this section of the city. This of course pushed any poor citizens that previously lived here out into the slums that as always were kept hidden away from the main roads. Well then, I'll excuse myself you two take care. Roland said while nodding slightly. With the money in his possession now he could go prepare a list of materials that he needed. He didn't even have time to look through the new crafting schematics that he received from the guild master. There was also the problem with Robert being here, for now, he was successful in keeping his identity hidden but this could change. It didn't seem that Robert was suspecting anything, this was mostly thanks to Lucille being here. It was clear that he was lovestruck and had a pile of roses inside his brain keeping him occupied. Wait sir. Wayland. Um was there something else you needed? Roland asked while stepping down into the road. Yes, we have a request but it isn't from me. Lucille looked to the side of the knight that was accompanying her. Roland turned his head towards his brother that instantly evaded his gaze. Why is he acting all shy all of a sudden? The suspicious behavior was quickly explained by Robert's next words. Yes, I have a request. Could you create a runic shield like the one you lent me in the dungeon? I will of course cover all the cost of manufacturing it. He said while pulling out a sack filled with some coins. You want me to make you a shield? Yes, we will be staying here for another six days is that not enough time to make one? Robert asked while his brows were furrowed. The shield that he lent to Robert had mostly turned into scrap metal after they left the hidden dungeon part. He was given it back later but the only thing he could do with it was to melt it down to get the deep steel back. Six days were actually enough to create a shield from scratch. He just needed a thick enough slab of metal that he could cut into the shape of the shield then shape it further with his hammer. Attaching the handle and some mana stones was probably the more strenuous process as it required more control. Then only the rune smithing would be left, this he could probably knock out in a day or two with his current skill levels. With his high mana reserves, he would probably be able to power through it without needing that many breaks. This also depended on the complexity of the runes as some of the lesser runes he could fashion in a couple of hours. Six days might be a bit. He lied, as he tried to refuse the offer. Even if he could do it, he still wanted to minimize the interactions with his brother. It was a half lie, taking into consideration that he wanted to do some other projects first, making a shield was not something on his radar. 
it would be difficult is that so that's a shame. Robert didn't seem to even argue about it as he accepted the refusal but before Roland could escape this predicament an overzealous ice mage spoke up. How about we just buy a good shield at the store and sir? Wayland just adds his runes to it. That should save a lot of time. Ah uh, well. Roland twitched slightly as he couldn't deny that fact. Would that be possible? Robert's eyes lit up in anticipation as he looked at Lucille. Yes, most runesmiths only focus on creating runes. There is no need for a sir. Wayland to craft the whole shield, with his skills he shouldn't need more than a few days to finish, isn't that right sir? Wayland. Lucille looked at Roland with a big smile as if she gave him great advice. She looked like a puppy that wanted to be petted but he wanted to punt her instead. I guess you are right. Not wanting to seem like a total asshole he just agreed. He was still talking to a noble lady with high status. She was his ticket into the magic academy and more runic knowledge, it would be unwise to alienate her. She might seem all friendly now but after she left that could change. That's great, do you know any good shops sir? Wayland. Lucille asked while Roland just thought about his next move and how to minimize his interactions with Robert. Good shops? I mostly send my assistant to buy resources and I also craft my own weapons. He did visit some of the blacksmithing shops just to see how the city was structured. This he did to see if he could borrow any new runic designs. But there are a few large weapon and armor shops here, I'm not sure which one would be the best, we will need a deep steel shield at least. Roland turned to Robert and started asking questions. What kind of runes would you like me to inscribe? Would you rather have a multi-purpose item or one that focuses on something specific, both have their pros and cons? Multi-purpose. Robert asked as he was not sure what Roland was talking about. Most of the magical equipment that people came across had one or two enchantments on it. A suit of armor would most of the time be given a buffing rune that for instance increased the user's strength. Then it would also have one active skill like a magical shield that could be activated on command. Roland's own armor could not be used by anyone that didn't possess a rune crafting skill. Without access to the runic code inside the item, it would be impossible to activate all of their features. This was why when Robert previously used his runic shield he could only activate one of its effects that was set as default by Roland. Yes, I could place activation runes at the shield's handles, you'd just need to focus your mana towards the activation rune to activate the spell. I wouldn't put too many runes though, the more there are the quicker the shield will deteriorate. This explanation revealed some of his techniques. This was mostly learned by him when he was a runic blacksmith and when he had to be creative. There he just used spots in the weapons that when a person injected their mana into it would then activate the desired effect. Fascinating, a multipurpose runic structure it sounds so elementary but also quite difficult if you take into consideration that the runesmith would have to customize the already created runic structure to fit the weapon. It shouldn't be that tough you just have to alter the schematics slightly. Alter the schematics. Lucille's reaction to Roland's statement was a bit strange. The girl's eyes went wide and she looked like the first time she saw his runic armor. Did I overestimate the runic knowledge of the basic runesmiths in this world? Roland was self-taught but this was not due to him wanting it. Due to this, he was still unaware of how other runesmiths operated. He thought back to all the schematics that he lifted from the stores. That time he only attributed it to not being able to enter the inner parts of the stores. He thought that these runes were just the basics that everyone used and then altered for more promising effects. By how Lucille was acting this seemed not to be true, it looked like altering an already established rune was not an easy task. By Solaria, you must be a real prodigy sir. Wayland, I just must inform the professor about this, I'm sure you'll have so much to teach each other. The girl started bouncing around like an overzealous slime monster. It took a few moments for her to calm down before the conversation could continue. How about we go to a store and pick out a shield for Sir? Robert here. Ah yes the shield. The group nodded and they finally moved towards the shopping district where most of the weapon and armor shops were at. 
as expected most of them were run by dwarfs. That was when another problem arose. Welcome to Malgut's armor shop, how can I help yet? A robust dwarf asked after seeing Robert coming in but when he saw a peculiar looking runesmith in runic armor, his expression changed. EY, what do you want? Don't ye have or fancy smithy? Hey? Is there a problem? Sure is. Now get. The group was shooed away by the grumpy dwarf before they could even ask about any available shields. They attributed it to the dwarf having a bad attitude, Robert needed to be held back from going back inside. In his eyes this was blatant disrespect towards his lady, luckily she was able to convince him otherwise. That was strange. Roland wondered if this dwarf just didn't like him or something. For now, they just continued to the next shop that was also run by another dwarf. This one reacted the same after seeing the intricate runic gauntlets that Roland was wearing. It was clear that they knew who he was by now and didn't appreciate it that he was coming into their shops. What's wrong with these dwarves this is the third shop? Yes, they are extremely rude, should we go complain to the mayor? Robert and Lucille weren't sure what was going on, but now Roland was sure about the reason. It's my fault. Your fault sir. Wayland? But you didn't even do anything. That doesn't matter. I'm a human and I also signed a contract with the Adventurers Guild, the Dwarven Union had probably given an order to ban me from all of their stores. Roland had to give it to the Union, they were somewhat neutral with him when he was just an up-and-coming craftsman in the woods. Now, on the other hand, the moment he signed a contract with the Guild they decided to go to war with him. This also meant that he might have difficulty in getting good prices on the market. He would need to get in touch with some of the non-dwarven merchants. The Dwarven Union, why would they ah? Lucille managed to realize what this was all about and stomped her foot in indignation. Robert on the other hand wasn't that invested in runes or blacksmithing so he wasn't aware of the Union's pull. After a quick explanation, he also looked maddened by this face. It's fine, this was bound to happen, it's just how the dwarves operate but not all of them are like that. Roland didn't care that much as he had enough knowledge to get by already. There was also the guild that would probably supply him with well-priced materials if he really was banned from the market. Such an approach would have worked on a more inexperienced and unstablished craftsman but he was now somewhat entrenched. Dwarves don't run all of the armor shops, think there was one place that my assistant told me about, we could try there if all fails then Lady Lucille you'll just have to buy the shield yourself without me. It would be better if Roland was with them so that he could pick up the best shield from the lineup but if he couldn't then it was also fine. He was not really that interested in making this shield in the first place. Oh, a non-dwarven shop? That seems interesting. Yes, my assistant always told me to go there as the goods are pristine. Well, what are we waiting for, let us depart. So they went towards this shop with the pristine goods. The journey took them away from the richer part of the city and more to where the regular people lived. The shop became visible soon and it had a characteristic sign with a bull with large horns on it. This is the place, excuse me. Roland was the first one to enter as he was leading the way. Robert on the other hand held the door open for his noble lady that just giggled. The inside looked a bit dark but it was certainly an armor shop with some shields on display. Greetings. What brings you to this Taurus smithy? A peculiar bell sound resounded through this shop and it was followed up by a womanly voice. When he turned around he realized the meaning behind pristine goods that his assistant was talking about. So that's why that idiot was always blushing like a 13-year-old schoolgirl whenever he talked about this store. Before him stood a large beast woman, she was at least 2 meters tall and had large pointy horns on her head. Her hair was a mix of black and white her legs were covered by long black leather boots. For a moment he expected to see hooved legs but by the shape that he was seeing she had regular feet. The woman before him had quite the assets that were barely being contained by a large smithing apron. Her skin was slightly darkened and looked similar to caramel. She was quite toned while also packing on a bit of muscle, it was clear that those hands were good at swinging a heavy hammer. 
The source of the bell sound was also revealed by a cowbell type accessory around this woman's neck. Ah yes, my friend here would like to purchase a shield. Your friend. The large woman turned to Robert while intently looking at the young man's features. Hm not bad, I'll give you an eight. You'll find the shields over there handsome, take your time. She pointed Robert in the right direction. The young man was clearly not used to women like this one so he took a moment to process the information. His lady companion showed a cute pout before both of them left to look at the goods. The beast woman then turned to Roland, she rested one hand on her hip while using the other one to rub her chin. Hmm, you have a nice deep voice but without seeing your face I'll have to give you a six for now. Uh, okay. Roland wasn't really sure what to say. The woman just laughed while standing behind the store counter. She then leaned forward which caused a certain bouncy place to be more visible. You must be Wayland the runesmith, you're becoming famous around here but maybe infamous would be the better word for it. So I have heard it doesn't seem that you care for the union's ban that much though. Ha, huh, those dwarfs can go screw a wild boar, they think that they own the whole market. Speaking of dwarfs you didn't bring that red-haired fellow with you, did you? Bernier? No did he do something. It seemed that people were already aware of him and Bernier living in the woods. This was a good thing as it would get people to think twice before attacking his assistant again. Ha, I guess the weasel didn't tell you. Roland wondered what this was all about, he did remember Bernier coming back with a black eye one day. He just told him that he got into a scuffle with some drunks at the bar, but maybe someone else was responsible for it. Ah I must apologize for my worker's behavior, did he cause any damage to your shop? To the shop? No, to my pride on the other hand are you sure you want to take responsibility for that? The woman replied while licking her lips, Roland flinched slightly as the atmosphere changed. Before any sexual harassment from either side could take place, Robert returned with a shield in hand. This shield looks fine, what do you think of it, Wayland? Roland's head did a quick side turn, as he moved his attention to Robert he could have sworn that he heard the woman clicking her tongue. Looks fine. The shield was a large kite shield that was in the shape of a teardrop. It was made from deep steel and was actually of high quality. Great, we shall take it. I see that you have a good eye for quality, sugar. Do you want me to wrap it up? The woman poked some fun at Robert who was still confused. Soon the party left the shop, the lady blacksmith sent them away with a bright smile, though this smile was mostly directed at the hand filled with shiny coins that she was now holding. Chapter 133 Runic Shield I should get this over with first. Roland was back home with the shield in hand. After coming back he reprimanded his assistant for being a pervert. Bernier just explained that he just gave the woman from the shop a little tap on the posterior as she was bending down in front of him. He started fearing for Bernier's safety as that beast woman would probably be able to crush Bernier's neck like a ripe melon if she wanted. He had glanced at her classes and he noticed that she had leveled a warrior class at tier 1 together with the blacksmith class. She had a bit of unique class distribution as she had gone through 25 levels of weaponsmith and was now an armorsmith with 20 levels to her. This meant that at level 100 she would be able to switch classes again, to what he could only speculate. She seemed open to doing business with him and might have had some ties to non-union merchants that could help him. It seemed that he was universally disliked by the dwarves in this city. There were some good blacksmiths that outranked him. Some might have even been tier 3 but there were no runesmiths besides him. This would normally give him a big boost to his wares as he had the first adapter privileges here. The problem was the dwarven union that controlled a big chunk of the market. Most of this could be counteracted by him having a deal with the adventurers guild. Even the union could not go against them as they required adventurers as bodyguards to protect their merchants and more. This didn't mean that Roland wanted to procure everything through the guild it felt a bit constricting. Being reliant on just one source was always an unwanted turn of events. It feels as if I was gone for a year. Roland opened up his workshop and was greeted by the usual stuffy air. 
This was quickly alleviated by pressing a button on the wall. One to turn on the light while the other turned on special runes that purified the air. What you can do with some frost and wind runes. He took a deep breath and could feel the fresh air entering his lungs. This rune that he developed would make any AC manufacturer jealous. It only used up renewable energy and was actually good for the environment. This also brought an idea to Roland's mind. If he had a contract with the guild he could probably convince the guild master to use some of his runes. From his conversation with Lucille and after going through actual runic knowledge he realized something. The runesmiths here weren't very flexible. They stuck to the old schematics and didn't even try to innovate. All the runes on the weapons were all the same type and they just varied by grades. There was so much a runesmith could do to affect the runic structures. They could still make a highest rated rune but turn down the output for someone that had low mana reserves. They could also do the exact opposite and crank it up. This would allow people to pick and choose items to fit their builds more. Ones liked to spam many attacking skills while others aimed for that one big attack that hit at that one right moment for maximum damage. This could be done with the basic sharpness rune. It could turn a blade into a one-hit kill skill by using up most of the user's mana. The regular rune on the other hand only used a small fraction to keep the blade in working condition and the rune from breaking. With that in mind, he could burst out onto the market with new innovative weapons. Weapons tailored to specific classes that took into account their unique characteristics. Ones that had multiple features for every occasion and even ones that abandoned all safety for that one last ditch attack. Everything could be done but it would take some time till he gets a feel for the market. Time to get to work. Roland placed two books on his workbench. One looked more like a binder with strings tied through old scrolls. This book showed him how to build the runic furnace in which he would be able to melt the mana stones. The other one was a lot thinner as it had the recipes for some alloys. These magic alloys would work as if they had an implanted mana stone in them. Thanks to them being a mix the runic structures would actually work much better. He would also save a lot of space as making the specific runic structure for the mana stone socket would not be needed. This would also allow him to make runic items of smaller weapons like throwing knives or throwing stars. Those kinds of disposable weapons could turn into deadly bombs while also benefiting from their user's throwing and aiming skills. He could also add paralyzing effects and even poison ones that didn't require the thief to dip the knives into any liquid. Thanks to this it would be quite safe to handle them even by someone that was not particularly dexterous. Making this smelter will take some time. Roland gave out a sigh while closing the books filled with crafting knowledge. Instead of the smelter, he needed to get this shield up and running. He placed it on the same workbench and examined it again first. Heavy Kite Shield Hi! A heavy shield made from deep steel, it gives a bonus against staggering to its user but requires a minimum of 55 strength to use. The user suffers a penalty to their mobility if the requirement isn't met. His analyzing skill had gotten a lot better. Thanks to it he could even tell the strength requirements of holding it. Tier 1 classes would have a hard time holding it in place as it was quite thick and bulky. Thanks to this bulkiness he would have something that would hold the runic structures for quite some time. Also thanks to this he could insert the mana stones into the rear side of the shield by just drilling into it. The holes would be shallow but it would be enough to place the mana stones in strategic positions. Thanks to the glue made by the alchemists from this world it would stay in place. Previously he needed to wedge it inside and have it physically stick in but now it was much easier. With that in mind, he got to work. First, he needed to design the runic structure to fit this shield. His brother liked the idea of having a multi-purpose elemental runic shield. With how large this one was, there was enough place to allow Roland to do this. He drew four circles around the handle that would be then drilled out to house the mana stones. Each mana stone would come from a specific elemental creature which would add a boost to the elemental runic structure. There was no end to red mana stones as the dungeon was fire-based and the brown earth mana stones were also plentiful. The rarest kind would be the ice one which he had to take out from his mana stone safe. The spell trigger points would be placed by the shield handle. 
depending on which digit Robert used it would activate the corresponding spell effect. Besides these four there would be another special effect that would be activated by injecting the mana through all four points at once. Roland learned a few special ways that he could activate the spells which didn't require all separate trigger points. Thanks to this he saved up on space while being able to make more combinations without running out of finger space. For people, without the mana sense skill, it was a bit hard to learn to control these types of items. Everyone was able to inject their mana into runic items but it took some time to be able to do it with their fingers and not the entire hand. Within a few hours, he had the schematic drawn up on a large piece of parchment. Even without his debugging skill, it was at the intermediate level. Bringing it up to the highest level gave him more experience as always but at his current level, this wasn't much. Soon the shield found its way on the drilling table. It was clamped down in place for safety reasons and was ready to be drilled in. The drilling table that he created was still utilizing his old drill. It possessed a crank on the side with which he could lower the drill down. With a couple of movements, the drill bit descended to the previously sketched on hole. Soon four identical openings that were in the shape of a tilted square were around the handle. With those now in place, it was time for some hammering. Before he could move to runesmithing the shield needed to be heated up. Even with his enhanced skills, it would be hard to force the runic structures in without previously softening this shield up a bit. The heated up shield was grasped by Roland. He did not use any tongs as he had made special fire-resistant gloves for himself. With them on he would not be afraid to stick his hand into a burning fire. His grip was as strong as a vice which meant that he did not have to worry about the shield moving out of place as he hammered it. Soon the workshop was filled with the noise of the face of his hammer hitting the deep steel shield. The traces slowly took shape while glowing bright red before settling down and becoming hard to see. Roland's mana started being drained at a staggering pace but it took a while before it dropped below 50%. At this point, he needed to take a breather or suffer the onset of the mana debuffs. This will probably take two or three days to make. Even when my skills increase, if the material gets better, the time it takes stays about the same. While Roland was busy with crafting this runic shield time continued to pass. The nobles mostly remained in the better part of the city with not many of them wandering outside. This was not due to Percival not allowing it but by their own volition. There were not many nobles like Lucille de Vere that were interested in the way the commoners lived. With her knight, she was seen going around the city which caused problems for the mayor and guild master. This was also why when they came to Roland's luxurious home out in the Bunas they were together with two familiar faces. Why are you here? Hey Wayland, how's it hanging? Do you wear that armor even at your home? Isn't it hard to work in? An extroverted half-elf called out to Roland from behind Lucille. For some reason, Lobelia was together with these two nobles and to her side was his favorite idiot. I'm not here because I want to, blast that old fart. Armand complained while frowning, it was clear that the guild master had forced him to be a bodyguard for this pair of nobles. This was probably the right call, having a noble be snatched up for ransom would be not something that he would want. Good morning sir. Wayland. I must say, this wall and that barbed wire look imposing. Lucille curtsied a little bit while hiding in the shade of her umbrella. Can those two stay outside? Roland pointed to Armand and Lobelia that frowned. Hey Wayland, what is this favorable treatment? Let me see your house, don't be stingy. She protested while Armand didn't seem to care. If sir. Wayland is against it. Lucille looked over to Robert who just nodded and then to her two bodyguards. Lobelia just pouted and stomped her foot on the ground while Armand decided to squat down. Great, come in then. Roland moved to the side and let Robert and Lucille enter through the gate. He was sure to close it afterward and also gave Agni something to do. Watch the entrance, if those idiots try to come in, bite their ankles. Woof. Agni stood up proudly while guarding the entrance, Lucille chuckled while giving the older puppy a few pets. I'm going to miss you Agni, here. From inside her pouch, 
she pulled out a large meaty sausage that she promptly gave to the tamed beast. Don't overfeed him. Roland grumbled while moving towards his house. Robert and Lucille started looking around. They could see the opened log cabin with a red-haired half-dwarf in it. The moment he saw the girl he was quick to get up and run over. Greetings M. Lady. This Bernier is at your service. He bowed his head quite low, unbeknownst to Lucille he was checking her out. The girl was wearing a long dress but this didn't keep the horny dwarf from licking his lips. Roland was aware of this and hoped that Robert would not be. Bernier, go fetch the shield. Eh uh, sure, I'll go get it. Bernier straightened out and went back into the wooden shed. In a minute he was back with a runic version of the shield that Robert picked out for himself. Here, try it on. Roland took the shield from Bernier and then handed it to Robert. The knight clutched it tightly while trying to get a good feel for it. Robert could see that the shield's rear side had changed and now had four mana stones around the handle. It fits my hand well. Great, let me explain the runic structure to you, how about we move here? Roland pointed to the side as he wanted Robert to activate some of the spell effects. Doing it right next to his house could cause some damage so they all moved to the backyard. Sir. Wayland what are those? Windmills. Lucille pointed to the two large wind turbines that were spinning around in his backyard. After a week of work, they managed to clean the backyard out from the debris and all the wires were placed back into the ground. Ah it's something similar, let's test the shield though. Roland moved his head towards Robert as he didn't want to have Lucille snooping around those turbines. He feared that she might start asking him more questions which would prolong their stay here. His plan was to just hand them the shield, take the money, and wish them good luck in their life. He wasn't even sure if he would ever contact Lucille with the magic crystal ball. This runic professor sounded like an interesting person but this would mean that he would need to get involved with nobles yet again. Good, now try infusing your mana into the shield with your index finger. Robert nodded and while gripping the shield tightly he tried to infuse the shield with his mana. The runes on it started glowing for a moment but then the light faded away without anything happening. Not like that, just your index finger, you are still using your whole hand, give me the shield for a moment, I'll show you. Robert's brows furrowed a bit but he gave the shield away. Roland held it out in such a way that his brother could see how he was gripping it. When he used his index finger to inject mana now the shield started glowing red and soon a red shield of flames appeared. Then to show off the features he used his middle finger which changed the shield into one made from green wind energy. While this shield was active a lot of wind was produced, while it wasn't as solid as the other shields it could be used to blow things like poison and smoke away. Can you see? Robert looked at the magical shields that were created and his eyes seemed to lit up. While he was focused on Roland holding the shield, Lucille was seen walking away from the two. Hum. Roland turned his head towards this blue-haired noble girl. She was clearly going towards one of the wind turbines that were further in the backyard. These turbines were about in the middle of the backyard, the same one that had mine runes buried in it. What is that idiot doing? His lovely assistant was nowhere to be seen as he could hear sounds of hammering in the log shed. Roland was far too busy with his work to pay much attention to the backyard, Bernier knew how to restock the mines and Agni would not set them off at this point. The mines were refilled after the fiasco with the thieves but before letting Robert and Lucille in he did have Bernier tie a rope to block the path further towards the backyard. He even hung up a don't enter sign there. Lucille apparently ignored this sign and slipped past the rope while Roland was showing Robert the new shield. Stop, don't move you idiot. His voice was loud but this didn't stop the girl from moving forward. The only thing he could do was to activate a somewhat unfinished agility boost that was only crafted into the armor covering his arms. Robert was stunned for a moment as he saw Roland run towards Lucille at full speed as if he wanted to ram into her. Almost at the same time of Lucille stepping into one of the mines, Roland managed to arrive next to her. The runic shield was still in his hand so he protected the ice mage from the explosion while holding her closer towards his own body. The explosion was somewhat mild but if Lucille stepped into it, 
her foot would have been gone. What do you think you are doing? Didn't you see the rope and sign? I am as sorry sir. Wayland I just saw the runic symbols and couldn't can't he. Eh. What? Robert was closely behind Roland but instead of helping Lucille up, he was looking at Roland's face. While unsure what was happening Roland noticed something. He could feel that something was missing, something that was previously on his head. Chapter 134 Brotherly Bonds There it was, down on the ground. A helmet made from metal with small openings for the eyes and a somewhat wider bottom for easy fitting. This was Roland's spare helmet that didn't really fit Bernier's armor that he had made. It was also not fastened to Roland's face as it was back down in the dungeon. During his rescue sprint, he had forgotten about this part. He did not think that he needed to fasten his helmet tightly to his body. This was supposed to take around ten minutes before Robert and Lucille left. He had not foreseen that the runic groupie would be attracted by his wind turbines so much that she would ignore the warning signs. Sir. Wayland your face. Lucille was the first one to speak up. She looked at Roland's face and then slowly moved her gaze towards Robert. This turned to a back and forth, it was clear that the two young men had similar facial features. A similar jawline, a similar head shape, and hair color even their noses were somewhat the same. There were enough differences to keep them apart but also many similarities for people that were familiar with one of them to notice it. Lucille was a person like that, she knew Robert's face quite well and could see the resemblance. Roland? Is that really you? Robert broke the silence before Lucille could ask a question. Just like Roland was able to recognize his brother at a glance, Robert was able to do the same. Roland? Not Wayland. Lucille asked while still being confused. Roland? Never heard of him. Roland after moving away from Lucille quickly turned around and grabbed the helmet that fell off from his head. Without turning around he tried to place it back on his head. Maybe if he played it off he could get Robert to think that he just resembled his long-lost brother. Before he could place the helmet on his head though, he felt a firm hand grasp his shoulder and yanking him back. Stop pretending, do you think I'm stupid? I can recognize my own brother. It seemed that it was over, the secret was out. Roland didn't know what to say, he froze. Many thoughts went through his head, he remembered his old life back at the Arden estate. He did not want to go back, he was just about to build his life back up in this city. This was supposed to be a new start for him with no shackles binding him. His own little life that he was fully responsible for and that he could shape in the way that he wanted to. Would running away be the only way? Would he need to escape to a different country to be free of his noble title? His mind raced, old memories of his old life where he spent whole days slaving away at his job making money for others. Then they were replaced by more recent memories of the fencer that had attacked him about six years ago. He still did not know who from the Arden estate had bribed that man to go kill him. The only person that he could exclude was his father the rest even Robert here could have been the perpetrator. Hey! Before he could utter a word Robert did something strange. Roland expected his half-brother to be mad or stunned but instead, he moved in closer. He was charged and at first, he thought that he was being attacked but that was just Robert's way of hugging. By the gods, you are alive. Instead of any hits, he received a big hug from his brother. Oh my! Lucille moved her hand towards her mouth and was unsure what to do. She watched as two armored men embraced each other, at least one of them. Roland had his hands spread apart in an awkward fashion as he did not expect this act of affection from his half-brother that bullied him in their youthful days. Um, Robert. After a moment he gently tapped his half-brother's shoulder which somehow brought him back to his senses. He moved away and the bear hug came to an end. You were alive. I guess. You were fucking alive. Robert's face switched from one of joy to one of rage. Before he knew it, Roland could see a large fist coming his way. This was an unexpected turn of events, so even though his class multiplier gave him higher physical stats than Robert, he was unable to dodge this punch. 
Hey, what's the commotion about? Bernier stormed out of the workshop to witness his boss being punched. He flew for a few meters and even tumbled once from the force of this hit. Is everything okay in there? What was that explosion? Yet? Yeah? What's going on in there? Let us in. The voices of Armand and Lobelia could also be heard. The knocks on the gate turned into loud thumps as it was clear that someone was trying to ram it open. Sir. Robert, please calm down. Lucille tried shouting but for the first time, Robert ignored her calls and charged towards Roland that was slowly getting off the ground. Fuck. Roland spit out some blood after being sucker punched. The world was slightly spinning as he tried to recover, his half-brother wouldn't give him a chance though. This didn't mean that he would just let himself be beaten up. Back on his feet, he put his guard up. Both men were wearing metal armor so even when Robert punched Roland's arm guards he wasn't hurting his fingers. After taking a couple more blows Roland finally caught Robert's fist with his hand. The second fist was also caught by Roland which turned the fist fight into a battle of strength. This competition would go to the younger brother that had a higher combined strength stat. Robert didn't seem to want to give up though, as his hands were trembling and being pushed back he moved in for a headbutt. A clean hit on Roland's nose sent blood splashing everywhere. Roland didn't falter though, his grip was kept on Robert's fists. His head flew back but it quickly returned as he smashed his forehead into his brother's nose himself. Robert's nose made a cracking sound as he rebounded from the hit. Both of them moved a step back their noses bleeding and brows crinkled. It didn't seem that the fight was over but for Roland, it was time to get serious. The two moved forward, both of them going into hand-to-hand -hand combat positions. Before the brotherly fight could continue a large ball of snow landed between them. It exploded into chunks of ice that caused the two to jump back. Sir. Robert, sir. Wayland, please get a hold of yourselves. It was an ice-type spell used by Lucille. It caused its targets to be covered in a thin layer of ice without causing much damage. She quickly ran between the two and it was clear that she would not allow another altercation to happen. Don't worry boss, I'll help you. After Lucille's spell Bernier appeared with his trusty runic launcher in hand. He had the weapon up and ready, pointing it at the man that attacked Roland. Hey, get this thing off me. No. Don't hurt Agni, he is a good boy. In the back, at the gate where he left Agni, Armand started shouting. The ruby wolf followed the instructions his master gave him. He was in the process of chomping down on Armand's ankle after the pugilist forced himself through the gate. Lobelia on the other hand was clinging to one of Armand's arms and trying to keep him from punching Agni. Her protests seemed to be working as Armand found himself not delivering any blows to the guard wolf. Roland gave out a sigh before straightening himself out. He moved his hand to his nose which was dripping blood. He looked to Robert who was doing the same, the only difference was that he had managed to break Robert's while his own was still mostly in one piece. We should talk. I agree. The two brothers nodded at each other while Lucille gave out a sigh of relief. Put that thing away Bernier, Agni let go of that idiot's leg. Roland called out to his two allies that followed his order, it was time to move the conversation inside of the hose where the nosy guild members couldn't hear them. Here. Thank you. I'll be outside if you need me, boss. Bernier passed some tea over to Roland and Robert while the two sat opposite each other. Lucille looked between the two and followed the half-dwarf outside. The door to the house was closed and the two half-brothers were finally left alone. Robert. Roland. The two men looked at each other without talking. After the emotional outburst, it seemed that none of them knew how to follow it up. Their wounds had been healed by some healing potions, so talking was not a problem. That was a nice right hook. You've become quite strong as well. Well uh. Why did you do it? Robert asked. Why did I do what? Yes, why did you not come back to the estate? Everyone thinks that you are dead, father went away to look for you. That old man did? Impossible, 
why would he care about someone like me? Roland replied in a mocking tone, he could believe a lot of things but not that his daddy was concerned with him that much. What do you mean? Father. That old man only cares about how he and the Arden estate look, let us not talk about him. Roland started becoming irritated when the theme changed to his father. He wasn't sure why but he disliked that man. He could not see him as a proper fatherly figure but as a tyrant that was mostly interested in upholding his family name. He was also the reason that the original Roland had died. What do you intend to do? What do you mean? You must return home with me, we must inform the family that you are alive. Robert smacked his palm into the table as he shouted. I don't think that would be a good idea. Why? Why do you reject the Arden name? Do you wish to spend your life as a commoner? Yes, that is my intention. There is nothing that you or anyone from that estate can offer me. Robert looked a bit stupefied, it was as if he could not fathom why anyone would reject the title of a noble. For someone whose main goal in life was to prove that he was worthy of the noble title, this was a hard pill to swallow. It was as if Roland was denying the path that Robert had chosen for himself. It can't offer you anything? You just... Listen Roland, I know that I have not been kind to you when we were younger but bonds between family cannot be broken this easily, return with me, I'm sure father will understand. Roland was a bit surprised that Robert actually apologized to him for being a little shit when they were younger. The second part where he still intended to bring him home still bothered him though. It didn't seem that Robert would let this go and there weren't many things that Roland could do to stop him. Killing him was thrown out of the window, there was no way that Roland would go through with something like that. Begging and convincing him would not work either. There was a moment of weakness in Roland's mind in which he thought that holding Lucille hostage and making Robert sign a contract of silence would be a good idea. Making more enemies with the nobles that were from Lucille's side was a big problem. Then there was the last option, telling him the truth. Stop, I can't return to the estate, at least not before I'm strong enough. Can't return? Strong enough? What do you mean? Roland gave out a sigh before leaning back in his chair. Fine, I'll tell you the truth. It started when our father allowed me to leave the estate when I was ten years old. Robert was given the real reason why Roland was skeptical about returning home. There was someone trying to kill him and that someone was probably in the Arden estate. He told him about the man that he killed together with the three adventurers and how he then fled the city without disclosing their real identities. That's what happened I never knew but who would want to do such a thing to a member of the Arden estate. Your mother Francine? Rainer, Edwin should I list out the entire family? If we weren't talking now, I'd still consider you as well. Mother? She would never. Robert slammed his fist into the table once more but soon started thinking. She would not. Wouldn't she? Roland asked while Robert leaned back some more, it seemed that even the son wasn't sure if the mother wouldn't pull a stunt like that. She never liked me, no one ever did, not even you. You know how they all are. Being the son of a commoner is reason enough but you seem to have realized it by now. Roland shrugged, he could already tell that Robert had been discriminated against by the other nobles and that he knew how it worked. He would need to gain many merits before his status could be on equal footing with the pure breed nobles. I can't imagine our elder brothers being behind this. Can't you? I. Robert crossed his hands over one another while lowering his head as he started thinking. Their older brothers were different, they were real full-blown nobles. They had no stigma of being born from a commoner mother behind them. Rainer was the firstborn and Edwin was the second. Even though they came from the same mother it was known that they didn't like each other that much. Wentworth their father didn't care about anything like age so it was an open contest to which one of them would be the heir. Even Roland and Robert could be seen as potential threats to their success. Thus Roland did not think it would be that strange for one of them to take a chance on eliminating him. Roland also knew that the two were also cold towards Robert as well as him. The two were older so they were already out working as squires or trainee knights even when he was younger. 
neither he nor Robert probably knew what those two were doing or thinking. You are correct, I can't say that they would be above it. Brother Rayner and Edwin were always busy with their training. It seemed that Robert also agreed with him, he as well didn't really know the true character between these two. This is why I must implore you to not say any of this to any of our family members. But I'm sure we can trust our father, if we bring it up with him, he will help us find the culprit. You really do trust our father don't you? Roland leaned back while replying in a mocking tone. He knew that Robert was trying to get into the good graces of their father and placed him up on a pedestal. What if it's Edwin? What if it's your mother? Would he choose them over me? There was a clear hierarchy between nobles and Roland was right on the bottom. Even if one of the culprits was revealed they might not even be punished. Roland expected nothing more than a slap on the wrist, maybe house arrest and Robert also knew this. Also why would I want to leave? I like it here. You want to remain in this small town in the middle of nowhere as a simple blacksmith. Simple blacksmith? Could a simple blacksmith overpower a trained knight that is older than him? Overpower? If we continued I would have. You would have what? Did you forget about these? Roland replied while moving his hand up. He was still wearing his runic gauntlets and as he injected mana into them the runic traces lit up. During the fight, he was not trying to kill his brother, which would be quite easy to do if he activated his runic attack spells. You changed. Robert quieted down after seeing the glowing magic gauntlet. From his previous experiences in the dungeon, he knew that he would not stand a chance in an all-out fight with Roland. Even less if he was wearing a full set of runic gear. Can I trust you to keep my secret? Do you truly not wish to return home? Not now maybe in the future, I will. Roland replied he would have to put his trust in his older brother. Since adventuring with him down in the dungeons he could tell that he wasn't a bad person. If he gave him his word, he would most likely follow through. I can make that promise but under one condition. You'll have to stay in contact. Stay in contact. Yes, we can use Lady Lucille's crystal, you can use it, correct. Yes, I do have the mage skills required for it. Roland was a bit surprised, his older brother seemed more concerned with his well-being than he had previously thought. When he arrived here, he looked to be more of a pompous prick but he was showing clear concern for a family member. If it's just that. Roland nodded at the request, if it was just what he wanted then it was fine. So you and Lucille? Planning to get married? Hey. What? Me and the lady? That's preposterous. Robert was surprised at the quick change of theme that he almost fell down from his chair. Really? It seems like she likes you. She does. Roland narrowed his eyes at his older brother. He wasn't sure if he was just dense or the barrier in status was keeping him from committing. Well, I wish you both luck, you'll probably need it. The two brothers continued to converse for a while longer. Which left the group of four people and one wolf in the dark. Chapter 135 Family What do you think they are talking about? I don't know, maybe about their unyielding love for heavy plate armor. Lobelia replied to Armin's question while he inched towards Roland's house. The moment he did though a growling sound was heard. This sound was coming from a certain young ruby wolf that was guarding the entrance. Can't I just kick this thing, it's getting on my nerves. Armand scoffed at Agni but Lobelia was quick to kick the back of his leg in protest. He is not a thing, he is Agni and he is a good boy. He is just protecting his home and if you tried I bet Wayland would just beat you up. Beat me up? Yeah, like last time. Why you, that was. While the two were arguing Lucille was to the side. She was sitting in a wooden chair that Bernier lent her from his workshop. The two were looking at the comedy routine that these two were performing. They really are close with each other. She giggled while hiding her mouth behind her hand. Roland's assistant just nodded but he did not reply. He was far too scared to do anything, with the genuine noble next to him he was not sure what to do. 
After hearing stories of people being thrown into slavery for being rude to nobles he was somewhat scared. AI they certainly are a lively bunch. Bernier was not sure what this was about but after taking a look at that Robert fellow he noticed the resemblance. He wasn't the sharpest tool in the shed but even he realized it. Together with the conversation at the beginning, it looked like his boss was connected with the nobles. This could spell disaster while also being lucrative depending on what this connection was. From the quick fight it seemed that the two were related, was his boss some kind of noble bastard? They are really taking a while, I hope everything is all right. Mr. Bernier, maybe we should go take a look. Lucille commented after having drunk her tea that was made when Robert and Roland started talking. It should be fine, I don't reckon they will start another fight I think. Bernier did not know how to reply to this question at all. The history between his boss and the noble was a big unknown. They did manage to calm down for the time being, so it was looking fine. You are right, it's better to give them some space. Oh? So she still remembers me? Surprisingly yes, this must be because of Lucien's mage class. At least she has her elemental affinities. Roland leaned back in his chair as he had discussed a few things with his older brother. The conversation switched to the family members and Robert informed him about everything he knew. There weren't really that many people from the Arden family that he cared about. Lucien, his little sister that used to follow him around, had recently turned ten. With this came her ascension ritual and surprisingly she had gained the same class as he did. Lucienne was Robert's full sister as she and Roland were only half-siblings. Francine the second wife was quite ecstatic as her standing in the family was cemented. Having a rare mage in the noble house was always seen as a boon. There were many paths she could follow but it seemed that her fire affinity was the highest. Apparently, this matched her fiery nature as Robert stated that his mother had trouble controlling the little squirt. So she still remembers me. Yes. She has an astonishingly good memory and she learns really fast. Robert was smiling, it seemed that he was a doting big brother that was proud of his little sister. Apparently, like most mages her learning capabilities were above average. She found reading and learning quite easy. There was a small problem due to this. Lucienne was able to vaguely remember her older brother named Roland. This brother had gone missing almost seven years ago. Thus the little girl had put it upon herself to find this missing brother. I hope no one is taking her seriously, just send her to the Mage Academy, she will forget about me soon enough. I don't think it will be that easy. Robert painted a picture. Lucienne for one reason or another was very adamant in her beliefs. She was sure that her older brother was alive somewhere and that everyone should keep looking. Wait, she was sure that I was alive. Yes. For some reason she was convinced and not even mother could talk her out of it. It turns out that Lucienne was right, how about I tell? No, don't tell her I can't trust a child to keep a secret. Robert frowned while Roland started thinking. Lucienne's fixation on him was something that he was not counting on. He also had a little theory about why his half-sister was so sure about her claims. There might have been a reason why she was convinced as one class in particular in this world had such skills. She might have the talent to be an oracle. Oracles were one of the main classes boasting capabilities to predict the future. Diviners, seers there were a few types but they all were under the umbrella of the magic classes. To get one of these classes a person would need to start out as a priest or a mage, then also gain a rare talent to go with it. Lucienne's belief in Roland being alive might not have just been a feeling, it could be something backed by a magical skill. This skill might have not shown itself into the open yet or the girl might not have mentioned it to her parents for one reason or another. It would not be strange if her fixation on him somehow activated this skill and let her confirm his status. These classes were rarer than the usual magical classes, her worth would skyrocket if she managed to get one. If this was the truth the people at the Magical Academy would probably find this out sooner or later. Lucienne would need to reach Tier 2 to unlock one of those classes which would leave Roland with a limited time frame before his younger sister discovers his whereabouts. It feels like hiding was never an option. 
He was already discovered by Robert but there was still a chance to reason with him. The younger sister on the other hand sounded a bit more emotional. It could still be a red herring and she might never get the class. Roland then steered the conversation in a different direction. Rainer and Edwin had left the Knight Academy a long time ago. They were busy working in the Kingdom's army and gaining merits. They were two years apart which caused them to butt heads together but Robert's info was limited. They apparently never interacted with him that much and so he did not really know what they were up to. Their father Wentworth has been a mystery as well. Robert could count the one-on-one -on -one encounters with him on one hand. It didn't seem that Wentworth interacted with his family much besides forcing them to eat at the table together whenever they were all at the estate. The oldest sister Sophia had apparently married a Viscount not so long ago. Diana, who was a bit younger, was approaching that age as well and as always they were planning to marry her off to someone rich or influential. Roland did not really remember his older sisters that much. Most of the time he tried to keep to himself while being trapped in the Arden estate. With a lack of interest from him, the others didn't seem to open up either. Then the last one was Martha, his old maid that had tended to him in his youth. Robert could not tell him much besides seeing her sweeping around the estate. Hearing that she was still alive and well would have to be enough for now. Roland was not the only one that was asking questions though. Robert started grilling him as his turn came. Roland had to explain his class but he only mentioned being a runesmith but he was not sure if his older brother bought it. Haven being bested in a strength contest by a runesmith was a hard pill to swallow. Can I trust you to keep it a secret? Robert started thinking, there was a lot of information to process but after a moment he finally looked at Roland and nodded. On the Arden name, I shall make a vow to not disclose this information to anyone. He was a bit surprised that he was able to get a vow out of his thick-head brother. He knew that the man took being a knight very seriously. Vows like this were not just spoken words, for someone that had a knight class a broken vow could cause them to lose the requirements for higher classes. Though if he switched to something else then it wouldn't matter. The moment the vow was pronounced Robert's body began to shine. This light was something akin to a written contract. If Robert broke it he would suffer a debuff. I didn't think that you would go this far. Roland was a bit stunned that he got this man to agree to his request this easily. Through their long conversation, he did figure out why Robert was acting this way. It was mostly due to Roland going missing and Robert maturing enough to feel bad about his younger days. His conscience seemed to have weighed down on him. The days that he bullied his younger brother came back to haunt his dreams after he disappeared. This was also probably the reason why Robert had an emotional outburst earlier. Going through close to seven years of regret only to find out that the brother he was worrying about was still alive, was enough to trigger rage. You are still my brother. Robert commented while standing up, Roland on the other hand didn't know how to feel about this. The attachment to this family had withered with time, the man before him felt more like a stranger to him than a family member. Still he had to give it to him, he had earned some brotherly points for that vow he made. Even though Roland could never see himself as a true Arden this didn't mean he could not be friendly with some of the members. The blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of the womb was an old misquoted saying. He was someone that believed in it as the bonds people made along the way were sometimes stronger than family bonds. I see, I'm surprised that you are the same Robert that I used to know. Are you sure you are not some kind of changing in disguise? Roland replied while being surprised that this young man before him was the same young brat that he thought of a nuisance. Thanks to his mind being of an adult he never held the things against the young man. It was mostly an annoyance that he hoped to leave behind after he escaped the estate. Hey, what's that supposed to men? Their conversation was then brought to a stop as Agni's growls started getting louder. I think we are done here. Yes, remember to contact me. Robert gave Roland his current address to send letters. He would also await contact through Lucille's magical crystal. This would really force him to buy one. With it Robert could even buy the services of other mages to call him, he would just need to write number to reach him. What's all this noise? Roland opened up the door to the outside, 
there he saw a maddened Armand shaking his fist at Agni. His ruby wolf was quite menacing, his teeth were out on display. Lobelia was also there, clinging to Armand's waist as she tried to pull him away from Agni. Woof! The moment Agni noticed Roland he snorted at Armand and turned around. His hind legs did a digging motion as if he was burying some excrement that he made. He then slowly moved to the side of his master while leaving Armand with a red face. Stop bothering my wolf or I'll tell the guild master that you weren't doing your job properly. Teach that mutt some manners first. Armand was clearly mad about Agni nibbling on his ankle. Oh right, you're going to pay for that, right? Hey. Roland pointed to his busted gate that Armand's shoulder tackled into scrap wood and metal. Hey that was an emergency you can't fault me for it. Of course I can, I can also report it to the guild. Armand was clearly mad but he couldn't do much about it. The gate was trashed and after he arrived inside the fight was already over. Mr. Armand was only doing his job, don't worry I'll cover the costs of your gate sir. R.O.M., sir. Wayland. Lucille had to stretch out after standing. Robert had already walked over to her after removing himself from Roland's house. She was already aware of his true name as she was given the short version. She also knew that he didn't want the people in the town to know that he was the son of a baron. Luckily Armand was a bit late to the party and neither he nor Lobelia were able to hear the previous conversation. Roland was also back to wearing his helmet, all so that his face could not be compared to Robert's. Armand wasn't really the problem here, Lobelia on the other hand had enough brain matter to figure things out. Right, I didn't get to show you how the shield works. Bernier moved over with the runic shield that was made for Robert. Before they could leave he would need to show the last trick of this shield. It's not much but it could help you push a troublesome enemy away from you. Also please don't go past the rope. I won't. Lucille shook her head and flailed her hands around as she was the main reason that Roland's secret got out. Roland moved over to the backyard that had a new hole in it. With now the shield back in his hand, he demonstrated its fifth function. With a firm grip, he injected his mana into all of the runes. This caused the shield to light up again while sending out a burst of condensed energy. This was a magic that would push anyone in front of the user away. It had enough magical energy to even force the larger beasts away. This spell had no elemental affinity and was more akin to a physical pushback. This spell is called repulsion, don't confuse it with wind-based spells. A repulsion spell, how interesting. Lucille commented while Robert got his shield. With a bit of training, he would learn how to handle this item. With this test product, Roland had also gotten a bit of an insight into the market. It would be hard to sell an item like this as most adventurers would not be willing to take the time to train with a multi-purpose tool like this. While in combat it would be hard to concentrate, a blunder that could activate the wrong spell effect could cost someone their life. Finally, it was time to say goodbye to his long-lost brother. Just before the exit that was ruined by Armand, Robert decided to turn around. He held out his hand towards Roland for a handshake. While feeling slightly awkward, Roland took the hand of his half-brother. They shook on it while nodding, he wasn't sure what Robert was implying but he nodded his head as their hands parted. Soon Roland and Bernier were left to their own devices. He would probably need to explain a few things to his assistant now but before he could speak up, Bernier was first. You don't need to tell me, anything boss, I don't care who you really are you could be the reincarnation of Solaria for all I care. He laughed out loud while Roland just took down his helmet. With no Robert here anymore there was no real reason for him to go around in heavy armor. Roland looked down at the red-bearded Bernier and nodded. Thank you, now let's fix this gate before it gets dark. I, I'll go get the nails. Woof. You want to get the nails Agni? Bernier laughed at the ruby wolf that started wagging his tail and the two made their way towards the shed. It seemed that it was finally over, in two days the nobles would be gone and he could finally continue with his life. Chapter 136 Preparing for Business There they go. 
It was about ten in the morning and a group of knights was moving out from Allbrook City. He could see a nice-looking carriage in which his new noble friend was occupying. This was clear by how close his half-brother was sticking to the carriage. What do I do now? Roland had a decision to make, it didn't seem like Robert would be betraying him. The vow was made, by how seriously Robert took this whole night business it didn't look like he would go back on it. There were of course ways to break such vows, ones that didn't result in the vow taker getting any debuffs and curses. Though they were extremely costly as they required the help of rare items or people with rare classes to remove. Thus being betrayed by his brother wasn't out of the picture just yet. Then there was the problem with his younger sister Lucienne that could find him when she got older. Her being an oracle or diviner was not a sure thing yet. Many events could transpire during one's life which could take his sister in a totally different direction. Does it even matter at this point? Roland turned around while heading back into the Adventurer Guild. There was a new thought going through his head, one that would end this all. It was just to go tell his father everything and be done with it. At this point, his class path was already cemented. It would be hard for his father to salvage this situation and force him to turn into a knight at this point. His class was also special, so it would probably be seen as a boon for the whole Arden estate. The problem with that was that his money-making capabilities were too high. He could very well see himself being locked away in the estate smithy working the whole day just to make money for the family. Then there was the whole assassination attempt. He didn't expect his father to do much about it as the only witness was eaten by a bunch of dungeon monsters. Assassination attempts and nobles went hand in hand. Unless the air was set in stone there would be tension between the siblings. Some even saw it as a trial between the youths, the one that remained would have proven themselves as the best person for the position. He was not a knight or a mage. If he proclaimed that he did not wish to inherit the estate then there was a possibility that his siblings would just leave him alone. After talking with Robert he saw that there was a possibility of Co existing with his family members. Even though he might be able to somehow move past that assassination attempt. This didn't mean that he wanted to be involved in noble affairs. It would still be a big pain in his posterior to have his overbearing father looming above him. I'll just wait. No use getting involved just yet. He decided to not reveal all of his cards. There was still a lot of time for him to build up his operation. Even if his sister came looking for him it would probably be at least five or even ten years from now. If she was even allowed to travel was also up to debate. She was still a woman and in this world noble women had one main purpose, to produce heirs for the man of the house. Would this special class be enough to save her from this fate remain to be seen? Even with that, girls of noble birth were still expected to be married by the age of 30. It was seen as strange if a woman by that age wasn't able to produce at least one child. There were a few exceptions as always but this required a lot of personal strength. Something like this existed for the commoners as well but mostly for the farmer and laborer side. The lady adventurers didn't adhere to these norms and could more or less do what they wished. It was actually quite a common occurrence for the women adventurers to be girls that run away from a forced marriage. The adventurers guild offered them an escape but they needed to take a big risk. Not all of them ended up in a favorable position after the years, some even returned back home to live an easier life. Glad I wasn't stuck in a girl's body when I came to this world. The doors of the Adventurer's Guild opened up and a Roland in a set of armor walked in. Now with no nobles remaining in the city he didn't care about being seen. His brother that he was hiding from had also seen through his disguise. The only thing he would try to avoid is being recognized as a noble. His resemblance to Robert was there but there were enough differences for most people not to notice. Even Lobelia wasn't able to piece it together so it would probably be fine. Welcome. Mr. Wayland. Good morning. Elidia called out to Roland while moving out from behind the counter. The guildmaster has informed me about everything, I'll be showing you around today. Today was a somewhat special day. His contract was signed and he needed to start his work. Elidia here was to show him the way towards all the affiliated adventurer stores. Some of them were directly here while others were sprinkled through the city. 
let's start with the shops inside the guild. Yes, I'll be in your care. Roland nodded while Elidia took out some kind of file. In it were probably all of the information about each shop. The first one was built to the side of the Adventurer's Guild and could be accessed by one of the doors in the back corridor. This was also the side that Roland and Elidia made their way in. On the inside, he could see various bladed weapons and armors alike. This was the back of the shop so they weren't as neatly placed or organized. He could see a few people carrying these items from here to the front of the shop where they would probably be presented to the buyers. This is the main guild shop, you can come here and take anywheres for enchanting. Good day. A rough looking man looked at them. He was wearing a bandana over his head and had a scruffy beard to go with it. Good morning Mr. Russell, let me introduce you to Mr. Wayland. Roland looked to the old man that was clearly checking him out. This is the rune smith? Isn't he a bit young? It was clear that his age would be a problem. Most craftsmen started out after getting their first tier, two class. This mostly happened in their early twenties while at about thirty they would start becoming proper masters at the craft. Don't worry Mr. Russell, when it comes to rune craft then Mr. Wayland is very distinguished. Distinguished. The old man glanced at the runic gauntlets that Roland was wearing and just nodded. It does look runic. It was clear that this man here would not really be able to appraise the runes for their worth. He was more of a normal worker that just hung around in the shop. Mr. Wayland is free to take the items from here so be sure to accommodate him. If it's the order from the top, then I can't do much about it. Russell just shrugged and finally left to go tend to the shop. I must apologize for Mr. Ruzel's behavior. It's fine. Roland didn't care much, respect had to be earned and not given freely. After the runesmithing goods started popping up he would probably change his tune. While they were here Roland picked up one of the blades and looked over it. With his appraisal skill, he was able to see the grade and the materials that the items here were made from. Would it be enough for me to make a list of requirements and someone picking them up for me later? There were quite a bit of weapon and armor parts in here. It would be quite troublesome if he needed to go through each one by himself. He was not willing to enchant blades of lower quality or that were made with non-magic resistant metals. Someone would need to go through all of these and pick out the ones that were worth investing time into. That wouldn't be a problem. Great. My assistant will bring you the list and you can also give him the goods or perhaps you could just send someone to deliver them to my house directly. Bernier would be utilized as an errand boy to his fullest potential. Though now after he also became a tier 2 armorsmith Roland was feeling bad about making him do such tasks. It would be much better for Bernier to practice his craft and not waste time by constantly going on fetch missions into the city. House delivery? Think that wouldn't be a problem. Elidia nodded while also writing something down. Soon they left the Adventurer Guild and headed towards the city. There he visited a couple of shops and smithies. After going through a few he noticed something. Not a dwarf in sight. The craftsmen and craftswomen were all from other races. He wasn't sure if this was a coincidence or if the guild master was just trying to usurp the Union's grasp on this city. Albrook was still young it would probably take a few more years for everyone to entrench themselves. This was something only a big company like the Adventurers Guild could do. Not even the Dwarven Union could just outright ban anyone involved with the Guild, they would go bankrupt. The Dwarves were dependent on the Adventurers, who went through weapons fast. The Armors also needed constant repairing. Not that this meant that there weren't ways that they could make it difficult for the Guild-run shops. Dropping down the prices and offering discounts for everything would quickly spell disaster for the guild-owned shops. The other revenue stream would be the nobles and their military organizations. They were quite large but with so many dungeons everywhere the adventurers took up quite the bulk of their operation. Unless there was some kind of war effort in the background the union depended on adventurers to sell their wares. Finally, they were at the last store. After this Roland would be finally able to go home and resume his work. This will be the last spot. The person inside is also both an armorsmith and a weaponsmith. This is. Oh, 
Does Mr. Wayland know this shop? Roland was standing in front of the store that he visited a few days ago. It was the same one that he picked the shield up for Robert. I've been here once. Soon the two entered the store and were met with a lack of customers. This was also something that was the same in all the other stores. It was clear that the Dwarven Union was making it hard for all the other craftsmen to make a living. From what Roland could tell this was a basic tactic to get rid of their competition. The Union had vast resources, with this it was easy to undercut the other craftsmen that needed to make a living to survive. Through this, it was also clear to him how the Guild Master managed to get this many stores to sign a contract with him. They had no other choice and probably had no love for the Union's tactics. Be right with you. After entering the store he could hear a dinging sound. It was the sound of metal hitting metal. This shop had its own smithy on the other side and it was clear that someone was working. After a few minutes of waiting the store owner that he saw a few days ago finally showed up. Oh? Well isn't it Mr. Rune Smith him? The large woman looked a bit sweaty. She stopped for the moment as she saw Roland before her, this time around he was not wearing a helmet. Not bad, I'll give you an eight and a half. Maybe in a few years, you'll be a nine but you'd need to be taller to get a ten. His previous score of six was raised after his face was seen. He was already quite tall but the woman was still a few centimeters over him. Roland didn't think that he would be able to grow any more than this, which would leave him as a nine. This is Ms. Diana, she is one of the blacksmiths working with the guild, some of her wares were on display at the main guild store. I see that you are already acquainted with Mr. Wayland here, he will be working with us. Oh, he will. Diana got closer to where Roland and Elidia were and quickly delivered a smack to Roland's back. Luckily for Roland, he had enough strength to tank this hit without falling down on his face. Great, maybe some enchantments can make me sell something, I'll be counting on you, handsome. Ah sure. He just nodded while the large woman became more handsy. Roland could even feel something soft press into his side as the woman got closer. So what do you need? Swords? Axes? Maybe spears or armor? I can make it all. The woman possessed both the armorsmith and weaponsmith classes and was close to level 100. By the looks of the wares here he would have to agree that she was a better blacksmith than he was. I would need items made from deep steel or similar metals that can resist mana degradation in the runes. Mana degradation hey. The woman finally let Roland go while she started thinking. Most regular smiths didn't really care about things like that as they just used the best available metal. It didn't particularly need to be good for enchanting as long as the weapon could kill monsters. How about these? Diana handed Roland a long sword which he then quickly checked with his analyzing skill. Hi a sword made by a competent craftsman. He could even see the dimensions, the whole sword was 120 centimeters long while the bladed part was at 105. It will do for now. Roland mumbled while looking at this sword but his words were taken a bit more seriously than he had thought. Hey kid, what do you mean it will do for now? When he looked up to the woman that was all smiles previously he could see her maddened face. It seemed that she took his comment badly as if he was mocking her craft. Craftsmen that were proud of their work certainly were not good at taking criticism. I apologize, this is a fine sword. I didn't mean it like that. Then how did you mean it? It's made from materials that are limiting to my craft, have you ever heard of a rune forge? Rune forge? Isn't that something that those midgets like to use to get their alloys? Yes, something like that. Roland quickly started explaining. This was a guild-run store and he had already discussed a few things with the guild master. What he was getting here at, is that he wanted to produce special ingots for the blacksmiths that were working with him. They would then produce wares from these fantasy metals that wouldn't require external mana stones like the sword that Diana gave him here. Ha <laughs> ha. I see now, should have said that sooner. Sorry about that. Diana laughed some more and started vigorously patting Roland's back. He was really forced to tank those heavy hits but thankfully Elidia was here with him. Miss Diana please stop, 
Mr. Wayland looks uncomfortable. Oh, does he now? He looked happy just a minute ago. The two women started glaring at each other for some reason while he was left standing in the middle. He coughed into his hand to get their attention. I'll be sending a list over to the guild to gather some equipment for the initial rune smithing. The first batch of runic weapons would be made with his traditional mana stone technique that left them on the outside. Then if they are successful in selling them they could introduce the improved version that would also cost more. With that his visit to the shops was over, a lot of work awaited him and his assistant. With so much to do it might soon be time to expand his business to the next level. Deep inside of a sandstorm, two vague figures could be spotted. The surrounding area was nothing but sand with no vegetation or water anywhere. Suddenly a monstrous sandworm burst from beneath the ground charging at the two cloaked figures. The monster opened up its toothy mouth that would easily be able to devour a full-grown man. The creature descended at one of these figures but suddenly the larger person's arm started twitching. It expanded in size while turning into something resembling a blade. As the monster descended it was promptly sliced in two pieces by this monstrous sword arm that this person produced. The sandworm creature fell down to the ground before these two strange figures stopped. I hate this place, I have sand in my underwear. How much longer will we be here? A female voice could be heard from the smaller figure while the other one that changed their arm into a sword remained silent. The high priest was graceful enough to give us another chance we must prove ourselves. Yet, yeah, yet. Yeah. The high priest, blah blah. This all because of some stupid kid, I hope he suffered a painful death. I agree, that child dared to desecrate the holy artifact, he deserves to suffer, his death was not certain. Not certain? What are you on about? There is no way he could have survived a stab from my blade. The woman screamed out in a maddened rage which was mostly silenced by the continuous sandstorm. Calm yourself and focus on the task at hand. The woman gave out a sigh while walking through these sandstorms. Even though the winds were strong enough to fell a tree these two seemed to be just fine. Soon the monster core was swept away by the sands as the two vanished within the desert storm. Chapter 137 Smelting Hmm, that should do it. Roland and Bernier were standing in a somewhat enlarged underground workshop. Due to the need of creating a new smelter they had to dig up some more space. This was not such an easy task as the more they dug up, the shakier the foundation above became. Everything required support columns and beams. Without Roland wanting others to get involved he was stuck doing this himself with his assistant. Luckily Bernier was quite proficient at this. The material they used was special flame-resistant wood that was easy to come by. The dungeon here in the lower area had ash-like trees that could be carried outside. They were very resistant, not much worse than rock but it was still wood which was lighter. It took them two weeks to expand the workshop to accommodate the building of the new smelter. Roland was also thinking about future endeavors thus he made it a bit larger than he really needed it. Finally we can start, let's bring it over. This would not be a regular smelter. Normally a smelter was used to extract metals from ores. This was not an easy process and most regular smelters would only produce metals with lots of impurities. The smithing equipment in this world went in a different direction than in his original world. There, techniques implementing chemical reducing agents to decompose the ore were used to drive off other elements as gases or slag. Only then was the metal base left behind. Here on the other hand, instead of more scientific solutions, magic ones were implemented. Anyone that had a class had a little bit of mana in them. A person didn't need to be a mage to run equipment like this as the lack of it could be counteracted by a Loken's fluid. This smelter that they would be setting up here was the same. In the schematics, there was even a little side section for the fluid tank. This would be something that Roland intended to modify. If it was just sitting in his workshop he could implement his wind turbines that didn't require him to spend more money. The smelter was cylindrical in shape with the top part being wider than the bottom part. On the top, there would be a bowl-shaped center with six smaller areas around it. The middle part was reserved for the metals. 
this type of smelter would require Roland to already have a ready ingot to be placed there. It could not smelt ores or purify them. The six spots around the main one were for the mana stones, there they would be melted into a liquid state, and then through small passages, they would flow into the middle. All of this would be done by specific runes that he would need to rune craft into this thick slab. Under the middle part, there would be an opening that would be closed at first. With a crank on the side, it would be opened by the blacksmith and the concoction would flow into the middle part of the smelter. Inside the bonding process of the metal and mana stone would take place. After going through some of the recipes that he received this process could take up to several days. This thing would burn through mana, the heat needed to be constant, and the magical runes needed to change the structure of the mana stones and metals they bonded to. When it was done the smoldering magical metal could be removed from the bottom. Under the smelter, he could place some kind of mold. This could take the shape of a regular ingot or something else. Thanks to this he could even use one of the older bronze weapon forging techniques. Most of the time he would go with the ingot route as he had to deliver these metals to the other blacksmiths in the city. They would be the ones forging the weapons and then returning them to him for the finishing touches. He would of course save some for his own crafting sessions but he wanted to focus his talents on other things. Crafting old styled armor and weapons was not the only way to go for a runesmith. There were far too many magical devices that he could create. One of those were the golems that he had an itch to create. The runic books that Lucille had lent him were gone now but he had memorized all the parts that were important. With their help, he was finally able to move forward with his golem program. Now the only thing was to build a basic body for his golem and start working the bugs out. I need to get that crystal ball and contact Lucille soon. While he and Bernier were assembling the new smelter together he thought back to the promise that he made with Robert. He was required to stay in contact, his brother would probably show up or go back on his vow if he ignored this request. There. Bernier wiped some sweat from his brow after hammering the last rivet into place. The prototype smelter was now in place and it only needed the runes to go with it. Due to it being made from separate parts it was better to leave the rune crafting for later. The smelter was made from very thick specialized magical steel. It also cost Roland a small fortune to buy the resources. The all-around shape wasn't hard to make but it would take some time till he got his money back. This sure is a strange looking smelter. Well, it doesn't require any exhaust vents, the runes take care of everything. Bernier just chuckled as he had already given up on ever understanding how magic and runes worked. Soon he headed outside and Roland was left here alone. Soon the slow process of runesmithing was started which he needed a whole week to finish. The smelter was extremely thick and the rune traces needed to be deeply ingrained into the metallic structure. If they were too thin, the smelter would not be able to function for too long. It would require some maintenance later on but with this, it would be able to last for a few good years. Roland took a step back to behold his newest creation. The whole thing looked like a boiler on four legs with a very thick bowl on the top. Two circular cranks one closer to the bowl part and one below the middle part were also there. Everything was made from dark looking thick metal that was not very shiny. In the back, there was one thick black cable that was attached to the bottom of this smelter. Roland was inspired by his old world electrical sockets which he now used with all of his runic tools. After connecting everything he could see the runic structures lighting up. Now it was time to test this thing out. Let's try half load for now. He placed three tier one mana stones on one side of the upper bowl area. In the middle, he placed some scrap deep steel that could be melted down into the new magical ingots. Just as previously stated the smelter lit up. There were several runes on the side that started glowing brightly as the process was started. The mana stones started melting and the deep steel in the middle as well. Then the first problem arose as the mana stones were liquefying at a faster pace than the metal in the middle. At first, he thought that this was fine but as the metal continued to melt he could see it. With the help of his mana sense and his rune smithing eyes, he could see the mana dissipating into the surroundings. If the mana stones melt before the metal, there will be a big loss to the quality. 
Roland stopped the process as he could tell that if he continued he would only receive a lower product. His mistake was using cheap lesser monostones along with higher graded deep steel which had a higher melting point. This problem could be easily alleviated by either placing the monostones in later or adding a little runic program. Thanks to his current knowledge, injecting a timer into the smelter's structure was not a problem. He was actually planning on doing this after going through some tests. His biggest advantage against other runesmiths was his high degree of customization. While others stuck to the pre-made runes to a fault he always looked into them and tried to make them more efficient. The problem here was that the smelter was really large and thick. It would take too much mana to change the runic program each time he found another magical metal. That's why he came up with another solution, plates, or cartridges. These would look like cards with runes on them. Each one would have a pre-programmed timer for every metal that he tests. Roland didn't know much about other runesmiths and their techniques but he had a theory with this smelter. Probably the runesmith or their assistant would need to place the mana stones at the right places and at the right time. This would mean that either he or Bernier would need to watch over this process and lose hours of their time if he did it the old way. With these cards, his assistant could just slide it in and go on his merry way. The cards would be small and easy to alter as well. First I'll need to test out these recipes that I have. The recipes that he was given gave him the timing of when he needed to place the mana stones on the smelter. The time that was required for the metal to stay inside the middle part was also included. Some of them required him to get other magical ingredients to sprinkle before the first crank was turned. This will take a while to figure out. Roland brought out a notebook to take some notes. It was time to test the limitations of this smelter. Later in the day Roland finally turned the lower crank and looked at the hot red metal in liquid form pouring down into his ingot tray. Hum. There it was, his first creation. Every metal that went through this process had the ether prefix. It seemed that the process was successful but how well this compared to an item imbued with mana stones the old-fashioned way only time would tell. His analyzing skill was not yet fully matured. If it was he could tell at a glance how high the mana saturation of this metal was. The only thing he could go off was the lesser part. I guess this will be enough. It was time for a test and for that he called Bernier over. It was not required for them to make nice-looking weapons like a dagger from this, a paddle would do. Reminiscent of his old days, he had Bernier hammer a similar deep steel ingot into a paddle wand shape. He did the same to the new etheric ingot. After making sure that the two were of the same weight and shape he began the rune crafting process. When it was finished he was left with almost two identical wands with the wind arrow spell on them. The only difference was that one of the wands had a spot for a mana stone on it while the other didn't. Back on the outside, it was time to give these two a test. First would be the mana usage which would be easily tested. Roland took aim into the sky and fired off a couple of wind arrows. The birds were spooked by the green bolts of energy and quickly scattered to the sides. Soon he discovered that the mana usage was around the same. Surprisingly the paddle with the mana stone lost out by about 10%. The ether wand is probably better saturated, if I placed another mana stone on the other one it would equal out. Roland was sure that the reason for this was the mana stone in question. If he added another one or a tier 2 one then the mana stone wand would probably edge the ether one out. It seemed that even with this technological improvement there was still use for the old models. While the ether metals could be further improved and didn't suffer from the exposed gems that could be destroyed. The mana stone variant could be customized a lot more. The ingot that was made also took on the qualities of the mana stones. If he combined mana stones from fire-based monsters it would gain bonuses towards that element. It was locked to this bonus and would actually work worse on opposite elements like ice. This was not really much of a drawback as most weapons stuck to one theme. There weren't that many crazy people like him that infused their weapons with multiple elemental spells. The armor that he had made would mostly be considered a failed item as no one besides him could use it. He was someone who lacked any elemental affinities but made up for it with a large pool of mana. Thus he didn't really care if the mana stones contradicted with each other too much. 
there was always a base quality to each tier of mana stone which should be the same with these ether metals. Great, now comes the boring part. With the first test being successful it was time to go through it again. He would need to start mixing metals, mana stones and everything else to create the best ratios. He already felt bad about selling a lesser ether item but not like he had enough knowledge and resources to get a higher tier just yet. Starting off with lesser mana stones and slowly building up to the common ones. On these, he would probably remain for quite some time. This smelter was a tier 2 item, it was only made from common runes and he would need to study it. Then in time, he hoped to achieve a breakthrough. When he was younger he managed to create common grade runes even when he only had a tier 1 class. This gave him hopes for doing the same here. The time continued to pass and Roland continued experimenting with the new smelter and his favorite alloy, Deep Steel. With time he was managing to improve on the lesser type of ether Deep Steel. This would also be his main experimentation resource. With a lot of scrap metal in his workshop this smelter was the perfect tool to produce recycled parts. While the young runesmith was working hard on improving himself other forces were working in the background. At a certain place, a group of short bearded men was discussing some business. So, how bad do ye think it be? I am nay sure, this human runesmith is not known to me and this. There was a large wooden table next to these four dwarves. On it there were a couple of bladed weapons, some look to have mana stone attachments. Bummer, your th magic expert air, what do ye think? I am an enchant smith not a rune smith, do nan. How should I know? Just look at it, you old fart. The two dwarves started fighting and finally, the one named Bummer picked up a longsword. It was a runic item with a characteristic blue mana stone attached to the bottom of the hilt. Th craftsmanship is amateur at best, meh apprentice could make a better sword than this. We know that, how about Th runes? Th runes on Th other hand, Th mana flow it's a very unfitting combination. What kind of idiot would put such pristine rune craft on a failed product like this? The old man shook his head while placing the weapon on the side. It was clear that this group of dwarves was discussing the new competition that came to the city. I, that's what I feared, we might have to ask for some help from TH Union but for now we shall wait. Chapter 138 Busy Days of Building Up Here it is. Roland found himself outside of a small shop. The building was squeezed between two others and the entrance was hidden in an alleyway. It looked like the owner of this shop was trying to not sell anything. The sign depicted a magical staff along with some potions around him. He was not sure why but all the shops in this world had such banners. It made him think of the old RPG games that he used to play when he was still in his old world. In them, all the stores always had a characteristic sign to show the player what was inside. He took a step forward, once he opened the door it triggered a bell that was above it. Expecting someone to call out and greet him but there was no response. It seemed that the person running this shop was probably in the back room thus he decided to take a look around. The first thing he noticed was that how cramped the place was. His head almost touched the ceiling and the shelves were crammed with various strange items and potions. With the help of his debugging skill, he could even spot some runic items. Is anyone here? Roland called out while approaching the shop counter. On it he spotted a little bell that looked similar to the bells at hotels. He gave it a ring and finally someone called out from behind. Hold your horses, I'm coming. There was a strange rumbling sound followed by something falling down. The voice seemed to be somewhat high-pitched yet also old. After a minute the cloth that was covering the entrance to the back room finally moved and the owner of this shop emerged. My apologies, must have forgotten the time. An old gnome popped his head out. He looked really old and had a very characteristic pointy black hat on his head. This was accompanied by a black robe which made him look like a stereotypical black mage. Roland had to wait until the small gnome slowly walked over. The store counter also had a little step ladder that he had to climb. How can I help you, young man? 
Do you want to buy some health potions, maybe some herbs for a bad back? Ah, uh, no. I'm looking for a crystal ball, one meant for communication. I heard that I could get one here at a good price. Magical items still weren't that widespread in this city. The dungeon was here but without having tier 3 monsters inside it would not attract the wealthier people. All the strongest adventurers were close to the S-class dungeon in the middle of the island while Albrook could attract at most tier 2 ones. A promising adventurer party would not remain in an area where the monsters were a tier below them. They would just not be able to progress further, the experience gained would be too minuscule. Besides the dungeon, there weren't really any natural resources to attract people here. Roland on the other hand knew that there was some potential sleeping deep inside that dungeon. That spot with the rare metals and mithril ore deposits was proof. Dungeon mines were sought after for one reason, the ore deposits would respawn just like the monsters did. The area he found could be farmed for resources repeatedly. The time of RESP awning was mostly set and could range from weeks to months. A crystal ball? Well, you came to the right place, I think I still have one lying around here, give me a moment. The old gnome called out and slowly moved down from the step ladder. He vanished behind that dark piece of cloth. Roland could hear something like pots falling down, maybe some crates it sounded like the old man was tripping over everything. After about five minutes he emerged back with a round object in his hand. His hat was now turned to the other side and his robe was full of dust. Sorry about that lad. The old man laughed and placed the object on the counter. Roland looked at it and thanks to his mage skills could tell that this was the item in question. Hey. So those came in runic form as well. Surprisingly this magic crystal orb had runic inscriptions on it. They were not visible to the naked eye, without his debugging skill he would also not be able to notice it. The item looked like a clear orb made from crystal how someone forced the runes into it was the biggest question. Roland was quite knowledgeable about rune crafting when scrolls and metals were concerned. There were far more materials out there that would not be able to sustain regular rune smithing. He would not be able to make a flying carpet as the rune craft would burn through the fabrics. The only explanation was that such a crystal ball required a somewhat different approach similar to the scrolls. There was still a big hole in his knowledge. While he was light years ahead in some places like rune crafting there were many basic things he did not know. Just like the magic ink there were various other concoctions that could be applied in various ways. What he needed is more knowledge and this here crystal ball could help him with that. For this, he needed access to the magic knowledge that was being held behind closed doors. Lucille, his new acquaintance, could help him with that. The only real problem would be asking for some help. Due to Roland's character he found it hard requesting help from others. Normally he would try to figure it out by himself but a promise was made. If he didn't contact her, his brother might come looking for him, this time with his father in tow. Yes, this looks like the right item, how much will it be? You have a keen eye for such a young lad, just for that you can have it for twenty small gold coins. Twenty. Roland almost keeled over as the price was mentioned. This was more money than he was given by his old adventurer party. He was able to survive half a year on that while also crafting scrolls and now this crystal ball cost more than that. You might not know it lad but this crystal ball was made by a powerful runic mage. Runic mage? Not a runesmith. A runesmith making a crystal ball? You must be joking young man. How could those brutes make something intricate like a crystal ball? They are better off making clunky golems. Roland was surprised by the revelation. If this old man was right then this item was quite rare as it was made by the unpopular class of runic mage. From what Lucille explained to him they were not proficient at crafting runic items but only using them. Instead, they were supposed to alter the program inside that was crafted by a proper runesmith. There could be some exceptions to the rule, most of the regular crystal balls were enchanted items. These could also be made by enchanters instead of enchant smiths that just clobbered metals till the enchantments fit in. There might be some special spells that the mages use for permanent enchantments, which would make this feasible. 
From what Roland knew, regular mage enchantments were temporary. They would last a few hours or days at most before the enchantment faded away. Thus the services of these mages were more like a trial which some adventurers used before entering a specific dungeon. Even though they were not permanent they had their uses. If there was a particular boss that was weak to a certain spell it was cheaper to go with an enchantment. There was no reason to buy a full set of fire-resistant armor to fight a flame dragon if a mage could produce the same effect for a fraction of the price. Twenty too much? Well, this is a rather old model. The old gnome started thinking really hard. Roland knew that this crystal ball was probably not something that would sell. There was no real reason to get a more pricey runic variant when the enchanted version cost less. The gnome also didn't know that a person like Roland would probably pay that price just to get his hands on a new rune. How about ten? Before the old man could answer Roland started bartering himself. Ten? Do you want to rob this old gnome young man? Eighteen. Eighteen? Can you even sell that crystal ball to anyone? New enchanted ones cost ten. Twelve? Soon they went back and forth and finally Roland was able to barter down to fourteen and a half. Luckily he still had some found and with the guild promoting him he was getting some materials at a discount or even for free. Bah, no respect for their elders. The old man was given the money and Roland now had a new item to test. If he figured out how these crystal balls worked he might be able to set up his own communication network. The ones that the mages used were similar to old phones. The lesser models like the one Lucille had required magical rituals that boosted their communication range. Other ones could use Elokin's fluid as a power source instead or be implanted in other devices that hastened the process. With how scarce the runic orbs were Roland believed it to be an untapped market. The problem would be how to reproduce this without the help of a runic mage. There was apparently one at the magical academy that Lucille hailed from. Maybe if he asked nicely that person could help him do it himself. His class was a rare variant, maybe with some luck, he would be able to learn the rune mage skills as well. The bell sounded once more as he went outside the shop and removed himself from the back alley. What people saw was not a man in red armor that was covering his face. Roland finally decided to quit hiding his appearance. After his conversation with Robert, he realized that he could not live like this forever. Sooner or later his past would come back to bite him in the behind. What he was wearing was mostly lighter leather with a couple of runic armor add-ons. He switched to darker colors and covered both his hands with runic gauntlets and arm guards. On his chest, he only had a breastplate and then his shins were protected by leg guards. There were no pauldrons or even a set of half-plate armor. This would be enough for protection as he did not think that people would attack him in the city. With the runic equipment, he was wearing he would be able to utilize various tier 2 spells which no normal person would be able to contend with. People clearly noticed him as the armor parts were brand spanking new. It was clear that he stood out from the general public and not because of his armor. After now reaching the age of 17 Roland started noticing people turning their heads towards him. Even now as he continued to walk he was getting these looks as well. This was due to one thing, his face, and his charisma stat. Even though it was not at the level of mind control it was above the norm. Roland found himself with something he was not very familiar with, being attractive in the eye of the opposite sex. When he was out, the women were taking second glances at his face. His large stature only added to his all-around looks. Why isn't it my favorite rune smith, what can I help you with handsome? Please stop calling me that, just call me Wayland. He had entered the store where Diana worked. She was one of the more promising blacksmiths in the city and was young considering she was close to level 100. Due to Bernier having been a little pervert he needed to come here instead. It seemed Diana didn't like him that much and would give him a good thrashing if he ever entered her store again. This left him to do the dirty work for the time being. Even though the woman had that look she was still a professional, when the time was right she would revert to a true craftsman. First name basis already? You sure know how to make this young girl's heart flutter. 
He wanted to comment on the age part but he was afraid to receive a knuckle sandwich if he prodded too much. Instead, he brought out some of the ether ingots that he had produced earlier. Oh, what is this, a present? Roland rolled his eyes and placed four ingots on the store counter. Diana grasped one of them and started looking over it with much interest. This this isn't regular deep steel is it? No, it's ether deep steel. I've smelled a few samples, what do you think, can you make something that will sell with these? After looking one of the ingots over she placed it back down on the counter before commenting. Doesn't look much different than regular steel, it should be enough for a long sword. What about the hilt? Doesn't really matter, I can place the runes in after the whole sword is finished. With the help of the ethereal pathways, he didn't need to rune craft before the hilt was attached to the body of the blade. He would need to exert some more mana but it was possible for him to force the runes in there without hammering it too hard. Ether metals? Never worked with them before, this will be interesting. Diana smiled while turning back to Roland. A moment of silence fell between the two as she looked down at him. How about we? Before the woman could continue though, Roland cut her off. I should be going, I have a lot of work to do. His chores were not over yet, as the two spoke Bernier was delivering the other ingot samples to the other affiliated blacksmiths. He hoped that within a week they would have one of these ether weapons on the display. For now, he stuck to the weapons as a full set of armor would be hard to produce. Even when the smelter was used for the whole day there would not be enough resources to cover all the stores. He was already thinking about building another one after he had worked the kinks out. Even now he was getting mixed results and the programming process wasn't that fast. It only took a little mistake to change the outcome of the end product. Leaving already? Won't stay over for a drink. A drink. The moment drinking was mentioned he recalled himself at ten. The long buried memories of being forced by certain three idiots to get drunk and pass out came back. I don't really drink alcohol. Alcohol? Why would I offer you alcohol? If not alcohol, then what else, tea? Milk of course. Roland narrowed his eyes and glanced at Diana's horns. Then the hair was partially white and partially black. Going down he saw the large bell around her neck that was supposed to be used for cows and not people. Then without thinking much he glanced down at a pair of large mounds. Of course it's milk. While having trouble with keeping his eyes on Diana's face he shook his head around. Ah uh, yet yeah, I think I'll have to have a rain check on that one. Rain check? I don't think it's raining outside. Roland just inched out of the store and finally got out of there. The last thing he saw was Diana's very saucy facial expression. He was sure that the older woman was having her fun harassing a young man such as him. What she didn't know was that he knew what game she was playing. That was close. Roland's heart rate increased as he handled the situation. Even if he knew what was going on, it didn't mean that he wasn't affected. He was still in a young man's body that was in his prime, it was quite hard to fight with the bottled up hormones. This was no time to relax, he had a business to build up. With the onset of his runic items that would be in proper stores his name would be known. Previously he used the auction house so no one really cared that much to look at his little crafter's emblem. Now on the other hand there would be a name to go with it. Things were looking good for Roland but he knew that he could not relax. Just like previously he knew that if he didn't prepare enough things could easily turn sour. Chapter 139 Making an Appointment Here is the last batch. Bernier placed a couple of blades onto the workbench and was having trouble fitting all of them next to the other items. When he looked around the workshop it looked jam-packed with weapons and armor parts. Are you sure about this boss? Even you will have trouble with all of these. It's fine Bernier, I'll just get this over with. If you say so, good luck, I'll go tend to the runic smelter. The half-dwarf gave a smile and a thumbs up before leaving this section of the workshop. Since the expansion, they had installed separate rooms. The largest one was the main smithy with all the tools, the forge, and all of the runic tools. Then in one side room was the generator room. 
It was soundproof as well as cooled. The generator that he made produced a lot of heat, which had to be kept in check with magic. Then in the newest room, there was the new smelter. Roland had made a card that Bernier would be able to use. It was programmed to work with deep steel for now. When he figured out the other ratios he would try the more exotic metals. A last room that was mostly unoccupied was also there, it was devoid of tools and furniture. Inside of it was just a board with a large schematic nailed to it. It depicted strange runic parts and symbols that almost no one would be able to decipher. First this and then I can get that project underway. Roland gave out a sigh before chugging down a large blue potion. It was bitter and tasted awful but the moment it was gone he could feel a strange prickly feeling wash over him. With the mana regeneration buff from this potion, I should be able to do this. He picked up one of the blades and brought it over to the furnace. After heating it up gently he started hitting it with his smithing hammer. It didn't take more than ten minutes for the lesser rune to be formed and the enchantment was done. This was his workload, for the time being, he had gotten some of the better deep steel and deep silver blades from his associates. The decision was made to not overdo it. Other craftsmen would produce the items while he just inscribed runes on them. This wasn't all as each and every one of these items would also possess a mana stone. The blacksmiths that prepared them were given the diagrams and fashioned the hilts accordingly. What Roland only needed to do was to engrave the runes with his skill and place the mana stone in the socket. With this phase one of their plan would be going in motion. They would flood the market with runic weapons that also lowered casting requirements. The runes were all simple ones like sharpening or impact, thanks to this Roland could work fast. His skills were quite high at this point and he was able to make these weapons when he was a runic blacksmith. Now as a runesmith lord this didn't pose a problem and he could go through them quite fast. The only problem was his mana, the more he worked the faster it dropped. Luckily for him, he was working for the adventurer's guild and the mana potions were given to him at 50% of the normal price. He hoped to get them for free but the guild master was quite stingy. There was nothing of the sort in the contract and mana potions were not a requirement for his work. They would make it faster but wouldn't really profit the guild that much as Roland intended to make other items for himself. The guild master knew this so he only went down to about what the guild was buying them for. Even this helped as Roland could now buy mana potions at a great discount. This was only possible when someone bought such items in bulk. There was a downside to the potions, a person couldn't just drink them constantly. With time they would cause a debuff which would be akin to feeling melancholic and tired. The only reason he was willing to put up with this debuff was that he wanted to go back to his own projects. Even with Bernier working the smelter they were understaffed. The trip to and from the city for more resources always took up a lot of time. With that in mind, he would need to ask the guild to lend them a porter. He was even willing to pay their wages if they just took care of the errand work. The work continued late into the night. Roland was seen with bags under his eyes and a somewhat glassy look. There that's the last one erp. Roland covered his mouth after burping. To the side, he looked at the empty six vials that were previously filled with the mana regeneration potions. With their help, he was able to power through all of these low-level weapons. In one day he was able to do what other runesmiths would need a week or more. His large mana pool and all of the bonuses that came with it were the reason. This along with all the skills that lowered rune crafting requirements allowed him to get this done. The only downside was that he still needed to boost himself with the mana potions but it was nothing that a good night of sleep wouldn't cure. I'll be able to focus on the golem now, before that I also need to take care of that. After taking a warm bath and for once not passing out in it, Roland headed to his bedroom. There on a cabinet was a crystal ball, the same one that he bought from the strange magic shop. He had already gone through the runic structure and everything that was important was scribed down into one of his notebooks, what remained was to go through with his promise. It was already late at night so he wasn't planning to talk just yet. What a person had to do at first was send something similar to a direct message. After this, the mage on the other side would know the number of this crystal ball and only then a call could go through. 
the crystal balls were large and required a lot of magical energy to run. It was hard to catch the mage on the other side at the correct timing. There was also a way to talk via writing which required a lot less preparation and was a lot faster. This was Roland's preferred way of talking as he never liked long phone calls even when he was in his old world. It was already close to midnight so he didn't expect to get a reaction. With a little prod to the crystal ball, he sent his message. It was just a simple greeting and he intended to call the person on the other side when he woke up in the morning. After getting through so many potions he was not really feeling too great. Hey! But as luck would have it, the moment he turned around he could feel the crystal ball gave out a chime. This sound was an indication that a person on the other side received the message and was going to respond. This was something that he could not stop, when the connection went through and there was a response it would commence the magic call. Thus when the person on the other side popped up on the crystal ball, she could see a very grumpy looking Roland. Greetings sir. Roland. It didn't seem that she was able to read into his mood too much though as she sounded rather cheerful. Greetings Lady Lucille, didn't expect you to be awake at this hour. I've been busy with my studies, after our little adventure I've been inspired, there is so much to learn from the runes. I still remember sir. Roland's runic magic during that battle. He was not able to get a word in while Lucille went on a tangent. As always he was praised by her, though it seemed she was mostly praising the runes that he made and not him for using them. I was worried that you wouldn't contact me, or that something bad happened, it has already been over a month. Ah uh, yes, I apologize, I've been busy with my work. Work? What are you working on? Ah, uh, I constructed a runic smelter for ether alloys but that doesn't matter. I just wanted to give you my coordinates. It's late, we should go to bed. Roland tried to end the conversation fast before the devilish woman there started barraging him with questions. He had already forgotten how much of a dark hole Lucille was when it came to runic stories. Mentioning the runic smelter was already the wrong choice as she quickly figured out the meaning behind it. A runic smelter for ether alloys? Does sir. Roland intend to build something with those? But if you speak about ether metals, those are mostly used for golems. Oh my, is sir. Roland building a golem. It seemed that Lucille was pushing her face up against her own crystal ball. It was as if she wanted to climb through it and come over to his workshop to look at the golem plans. Why yes, something like that. Lady Lucille, could you tell my brother that I'm doing fine? He quickly steered the conversation elsewhere in the hopes that he would not need to talk about his runic wares. Sir. Robert? Ah uh, yes, I'll be sure to include this information the next time I see him. Lucille seemed to quiet down but soon she recalled something. Speaking of Sir. Robert, I think his shield did quite the impression on the professor. The professor? Roland recalled that Lucille mentioned such a person before. This was supposed to be some old teacher that was also a rune mage. Being a reclusive introvert as he was, Roland was not looking forward to the introduction. There was a finite number of people that he could stomach. On the other hand, this person could help him with his research if he ever got stuck on something. Lucille had already informed him about his extensive knowledge and years of expertise. If this professor was a runic mage he would probably be very knowledgeable about the software part of the runes. This was probably his biggest weak point. He even felt confident in recreating tier 3 runes if he was ever able to procure them in the future. As it stood now, he lacked the funds to get them and he didn't feel like rushing it was the right plan. While he still lacked a perfect understanding of the software component in the tier 2 runes there was no reason to jump those steps yet. He would arrive there sooner or later and with time his heightened skills and stats would also make things easier. Ah yes, there was a person like that. Yes, when the professor saw Sir Robert's shield. Lucille covered her mouth and started giggling, it seemed that something happened between the second runic nut from the Magic Institute. This time around his brother fell victim to it. Did Robert give his shield to the professor? Give it? No, 
he borrowed it and it was returned to him after a week, you should have seen how he pouted. Roland had a hard time imagining Robert's pouting face, the man was quite gruff looking, he probably looked like a powder keg waiting to explode. Yes, I promised the professor that I would introduce the creator of that shield, could we arrange an appointment? An appointment? Yes, how about in two days? The professor is busy for now, don't want to intrude but it should be fine in two days. Two days? Two days it is then. It's getting late and I'm running low on mana, we will have to continue this conversation later. Before Roland could decline the invitation to the appointment Lucille vanished from the crystal ball. It seemed that he would need to have a talk with this professor. He recalled his old university days and was reminded how some of those professors there acted. If he didn't go through with this his only connection to the magic academy could be void. Ugh fine, what can go wrong? He tossed his hands up into the air before flopping down onto his bed. The fatigue from the full days of work washed over him and he fell asleep. Even his skill that resisted skill was not strong enough to counteract mana deprivation and build up stress. Ugh, there was not supposed to be a headache. On the dawn of the next day, Roland awoke with a splitting headache. He dragged his tired body into the kitchen to drink some pain-alleviating tea. It was possible to do this with more potions but there were also less intrusive ways of countering such pain. The migraine didn't go away fully but it was bearable enough for him to work now. Damn, it feels like I'm working back at the old repair shop. While placing some food in Agni's bowl he recalled his old life. There he did spend time on the computer late into the night. In the morning he woke up half dead and still needed to go to work. Good morning boss. Hey they're burning, could you bring the weapons back to the guild? Oh, did you take care of all of them? You don't look so good, maybe you should take a break today. A break hey. While Bernier gave him the idea to take a break Roland didn't really know what to do with that. In his past life playing games on his computer was his only pastime. The rest of the day was spent on work or cooking for himself. In this world on the other hand he didn't really have a normal hobby. Even if he wanted to take a break he found himself thinking back to runes and how he could improve them. There wasn't really anything he wanted to do, instead of wasting time like that it was better to go down into the dungeon to train up Agni. I'm fine, I just need some tea and a couple of hours to recover. Also, give this letter to Elidia, she will know what to do with it. Bernier grabbed the sealed letter that Roland wrote not so long ago. In it, he just asked for a part-time porter that they could spare to work for him. Oh, what is this? Bernier looked at the letter in question and tried to peek into the writing. At the end of his examination, he gave Roland a big grin followed by an elbow to the side. I didn't know that you had it in you boss, little Elidia isn't bad, I would have gone for the elf myself. She feels like the fun type if you know what I mean. Roland just sipped his tea while looking at his pervy assistant with an empty look. Could you for once stop thinking with your underside, it's business related. But I like my underside and the ladies love it too, hee hee. Bernier started laughing before removing himself from Roland's house. Woof. What is it Agni? Soon Roland was left behind with his ruby wolf. He was jumping around a lot this day and he had a sinking suspicion as to why. You probably want to go into the dungeon, hey. Woof. Agni's level was approaching 50, it would probably only take one more dungeon run before this adolescent wolf became a proper adult. The only problem was that Roland wanted to focus on his golem but for some reason, there were other things pulling him away from constructing it. Can we do it next week? I need to work on something. Agni started whining and his tail curled up. No don't look at me like that. Roland was given the puppy eye treatment that he was weak against. It didn't always work but this time around it seemed that Roland was getting swayed. God damn it, fine my head is killing me anyway let's go to the dungeon. He stood up while Agni started jumping around and making circles. His head was feeling hazy and he felt that if he started his work he would be making a lot of mistakes. It would take about half a day till he recovered so killing a few monsters would be a nice change of pace. 
Luckily for him, using runic weapons didn't require much concentration. Just let me grab my armor. Woof. Chapter 140 Golem Core That should do it. Roland stood back while looking at his tamed beast. Agni was in the process of brutalizing a volcanic salamander. At level 49 he was already able to handle these monsters that were a tier above him, with a little help from his master that applied some chilling spells. There were a few ways to gain the system in this world. Most of the experience went to the person that did the most damage thus it made last hitting practically dead enemies give low amounts of experience points. The only option to power level others would be applying debuffs instead. These debuffs would count for less and could disable the enemies which was happening now. The monsters that required high temperatures to operate were very easy to disable with a simple chilling spell. Volcanic Wolf Fire slash Earth slash Beast The adult version of a common canine type monster found in volcanic regions. Their mane and paws are covered by even more volcanic rocks. Ruby Wolf Fire slash Earth slash Beast the adult version of an uncommon canine type monster found in volcanic regions. With the increase in size, their rubies become even more apparent. Gemstone Wolf Fire slash Earth slash Beast An adult rare canine type monster found in deep dungeons. This adult tier 2 variant's size is close to a small horse. It gains an armor-like pelt that is good at resisting physical attacks. Mystical Ruby Wolf Fire slash Earth slash Beast A rare adult variant of the Ruby Wolf. The gem on its forehead grows in size. This monster is highly intelligent and can learn basic spells. He could see some of the old evolution options still being there like the Volcanic Wolf and even the Gemstone Wolf. From the description, it seemed that the Gemstone variant was quite big, if it was the size of a smaller horse it might have been mountable. The mystical ruby variant was also there but Roland saw a small problem. While all the other options looked the same, the one that he wanted was grayed out. There was one explanation for this, some of the requirements have not been met. Well boy, I think you'll have to work on your skills before we can evolve you further. Agni gained most of his levels thanks to sharing experience with his master. Due to this, he leveled up a lot faster than the other monsters. This meant that his skills naturally lagged behind as he could only progress with them when they were used. Woof. Agni gave out a weak woof this time around, it seemed that he knew what the problem was. The main skill that he gained from munching on mana stones had not reached the ninth level yet. His skills that controlled mana were not quite there yet as well, he would probably need to level them all up before this option became available. You can have some more mana stones back home but you are not getting that big mana stone. Ever since returning from the last expedition, Agni has been eyeing the large mana stone he got from the dinosaur looking monster. It was quite big for a tier 2 monster that had already evolved once. He was saving it for something else, it would be melted down into ether alloys that would then be used for his own armor. With the quality of that mana stone, he was sure that he would be able to get a better grading on the metal. Before we go home, we still need to take care of one more thing, let's go. The man and Ruby Wolf party went on their ways towards the deeper areas of the large open lower floor. There was one monster in particular that he wanted to hunt as he required parts of it for his next project. After about 30 minutes of walking, he came into a section that the noble party evaded before. There he saw one, it was big and it looked dangerous. It was a golem that was about 4 meters tall which made it twice Roland's size. The ruby golem that he faced before was even bigger than this one so he wasn't worrying as much. This monster had a brownish orb sticking out from its left rocky shoulder. It was hard to notice as it was barely exposed but Roland had come just for it. It was the golem's core that spawned at random places inside of these golems. They were hard to spot which brought troubles to adventurers that tried to fight it. If this golem core was destroyed so would be the monster that had it. He needed this item for his own golem as it was much easier to use a monster golem's core than to fashion one instead. It was also a lot cheaper for him to grab one down in the dungeon than to buy one from the market. 
Roland was already quite strong so he decided to gather his resources while also getting Agni to level 50. Some might say that he was being a penny pincher as he could afford a golem core while just crafting. He could only nod to that accusation as if he had a way to save money that wasn't too hard he would use it. Okay Agni, wait here. You might have leveled up but your teeth won't do much damage on a golem. Agni whined a bit but stayed behind like his master ordered him to. With slow steps he approached the monster, the runic symbols on his gauntlets glowing blue as he got ready to cast a spell. The monster finally noticed the human opponent approaching and started to sluggishly attack. Roland didn't panic as he opened up his palms, a blue orb of chilling energy formed in front of them. Before the monster could get into striking position Roland activated his runic spell. While pointing the orb of blue light in the golem's direction a burst of cold was discharged. The monster took a direct hit but continued to lumber towards its enemy. Each step it took caused the bedrock below to crumble. Each time a thumping sound was heard and it was not stopping. Finally, it was standing in front of the human that was attacking it. The golem moved its lumbering hand up but as it attempted to move it down to squash the smaller enemy it found itself unable to. That should do it. The golem stood still as it was frozen in place by Roland's magic. For someone like him, that could switch magic attributes for every occasion fighting monsters like this was quite easy. Now then. On his back, he had a large sledgehammer that he brought over for just the occasion. With one powerful swing to the golem's leg, he brought it down to the ground. With a couple of more, its legs and arms were all shattered at the joints as he rendered the creature immobile. The golems were hard enemies to beat for low-level adventurers. They were resistant to bladed weapons and even heavy blunt ones had trouble causing much damage. For Roland that boasted overwhelmingly higher stats and buffing effects, this was not a tough enemy. After the monster was disabled Roland brought out a chisel and hammer from his spatial bag. These golem cores were quite brittle so he could not risk landing blows at the shoulder area. They were quite resistant to magical effects which made them perfect for rune crafting. There we go, you can come over now Agni. Agni wiggled his tail while approaching the frozen golem. Once the core was removed this monster became nothing more than rocks. Even then Roland had to shake his head at his wolf that started desecrating the dead pile of rocks as if it could fight back. Let's get a few more and return home, my headache is gone too. After spending most of the day down in the dungeon Roland returned home. Just as before he used the shortcuts in the dungeon to quickly make his way up. This was still something that he did not report to the guild. He feared that they would task him with mapping out the entire dungeon and searching for all the hidden chambers. This was something that he intended to do on his own later. The probability of another runesmith going down and spotting these hidden rooms was quite low so he wasn't worried. It was already getting late but there was this itch that he just needed to scratch. With everything ready, he descended into his workshop and into the mostly empty room that was reserved for just this type of work. He placed five orbs of various sizes and colors on his workbench. All of them belonged to golems that he faced down in the dungeon and would be used for his experiments. It's not good that they don't all have the same dimensions, which might alter the results. Roland gave out a sigh after holding two of the golem cores in each hand. One that came from AL51 golem was much smaller than the other that came from one that was ten levels above it. The larger the core the more punishment it could handle but it was also harder to rune craft on. For the time being, he decided to start with the smallest one and work himself up. He hoped that he could start building a working prototype by the time he got to the fifth one. Otherwise, he would need to descend into the dungeon yet again. There were many types of golems in this world. Ones made from rocks, ones made from metal, ones made from flesh and even ones made from pure energy. The one that his class was focused on would be the metal one. There were various ways a person could get a golem to do their biddings. The most rudimentary way would be to just use a pre-existing spell. Such golems could be summoned by the summoner type classes and supposedly these summons came from some kind of different dimension. They were practically the same type of being as the golem monster that he took care of today. Even though they were easy to come by they could not remain in this world for too long. 
They burned up the caster's mana and the longer they remained the more they would require. Supposedly there were ways of extending their stay. Some included contracts that would make a golem like this a caster's familiar than other ways that remained a mystery to Roland as he lacked the book smarts. If someone wanted a more permanent golem, they needed to work for it. Making one was the other option and it also came in many ways. Even magicians could produce a golem by gathering the right materials and casting the right spell. As long as the golem had a core and a power source it would be operational. The ones magical smiths like him made came in various shapes and sizes. The golem core was the brain of this construct. It would need to be ingrained with the correct operating system. This was where he would inject the runic system that he studied from the miniature toy golem. Before the system could be implanted he needed to fashion a body for its shell. Depending on the shape of the golem the golem core would need to be altered. Due to this reason, Roland decided to make his first golem to be similar to the toy that he studied. The small golem that he had was a bipedal one, two legs, and two arms. The operating system came with a few pre-existing features that he was afraid to touch at the moment. Only after having a working prototype would he be able to see what his alterations did to the way it behaved. After glancing at his notes and the schematics on the wall he could not wait. He grasped the golem core and started to concentrate. His mana traveled to his fingertips and started to slowly insert itself into the golem's core. The core started trembling as if it was resisting. The material he was working with would not be able to resist his regular rune smithing blows so he was forced to do it by hand. The core still had some data left from the monster it came from. First, he needed to delete all of this data before inserting his own. It was similar to formatting a hard drive from an old operating system before putting on a new one. Even if there was space to fit another operating system it was ill-advised. It would only take up space and could very well corrupt the parts that the runesmith was working on. Then finally with a resounding burst, the golem core shattered into many tiny pieces. Roland was quick to close his eyes and turn his face, the crystal-like substance that the core was made from shattered against the walls of this room and even collided with the other cores that were on the workbench. I guess that was too much mana. Five cores turned to four, then he was down to three as another one exploded. By the second attempt, he had put on safety goggles so that he could see when the core became unstable. I might need better quality cores. As with everything in this world the cores were also ranked by grades. This tier 2 golem core was still on the lower end, thus they were more delicate to work with than higher quality cores. Some were so resistant to mana that they would never break, while others like tier 1 cores were almost impossible to work with as they shattered with the smallest amount of magic. Finally, on the third core he managed to erase the chaotic monster program. It was not runic in nature so it looked like a bunch of chicken scratch to him. The original monster brain that was ingrained into this core would probably be a good way to study it but he had no idea how to decipher this language. The monsters in the dungeon were able to form some degree of battle strategies. It would be quite a simple process if he could just translate everything into runic form. Then he would have something akin to a summoned monster. That is if he could get it to recognize him as its master. Otherwise, he would be just making a machine that would murder him instantly. Ugh this is harder than I expected. The fourth golem core shattered when he was about halfway through his rune inserting process. Now left with only one remaining core he was troubled. Should he go for it or should he wait till his skills leveled up before attempting more? Roland glanced at his status screen and could see that he was still lacking in a few places. His mana controlling skills were not maxed out and his rune related skills weren't either. The progress with them had almost stopped, he could now see why people had troubles advancing towards tier 3 classes. Even now at his first tier 2 class, he was having troubles and he still needed to get another one before he could attempt another advancement. Maybe it was stupid of me to try this so late into the night. He gave out a sigh and placed the last golem core down. It seemed that he was overzealous in his first attempt, maybe if he got a good night's rest he could try it once more. There is also that thing tomorrow. Roland went to bed while dreading the next day as then came the time for his appointment. When he was eating his breakfast he started hearing a sound, 
it was coming from his bedroom. I should have more time. Why is Lucille calling me already? The communication crystal was already beckoning him over. It was the day that he was supposed to talk with that professor person. He feared that he would make a bad impression on the man or that he would be called an idiot by someone more experienced in the runes. Even though he didn't like asking for help, he could tell that he would make a lot more progress if he had someone to bounce his ideas off of. Thus with a bit of resistance, he finally answered the call. There he saw an unfamiliar face, a face that he did not expect that would belong to someone called the professor. Ah, there you are, the fabled country bumpkin rune smith. He could vaguely see Lucille standing in the back and waving. She had a strange apologetic expression on her face. What he saw was quite the sight as instead of a person he was looking at a black cat. It looked to be a regular old cat, the most characteristic thing about it was the monocle covering its left eye. Well this is certainly unexpected.